Reconvene. We're going to pick up with um, agenda item seven. rest last night. I um, want to talk to you this morning about the management strategy evaluation, where we're at with that, and um, what, uh, what the secretary believes are some decision points for you related to the, the MSE. So, if you remember about two years ago, I think it was special session 11, uh, we developed a MSA program of work with commissioner input, and here are the tasks associated with that program of work. There were four related to the framework, there were two management procedures to investigate, and then the last task is related to evaluation and improving sort of the evaluation process, especially related to this program of work. So what I want to do this morning is step through all of these and show you how this program of work is complete for presentation at the 99th annual meeting. The uh, elements related to the framework were improving the, the operating model. Now it's developing migration scenarios and developing alternative operating models. So a, a lot of improvements happened to the operating model this year. Um, including uh, four individual models are now included, sort of an ensemble approach and a similar uh, approach that the assessment is done to characterize structural uncertainty. And these four individual models incorporate different natural mortality rates, a high and a low, basically, um, and different resulting migration assumptions, and also variability in that migration. So. There are differences from the stock assessment in this operating model. One is that it's a regional model with migration between areas. Um, and and um, that's one of the biggest differences, basically. But as you may have noticed yesterday, when Dr. Stewart presented the, the stock assessment, he, um, he presented that he's now estimating uh, natural mortality in three of the four models, whereas two of the models have a low natural mortality in the 
this um, operating model. We're not too concerned about that because there are differences. And one of those big differences is um, natural mortality has uncertainty in all four of these models. So it is covering a wider range than the assessment does. And um, that uncertainty sort of captures what the new assessment is doing in a way. So overall, we believe these, this operating model is representative of dynamics and uncertainty in the Pacific health of population and is useful for examining the management procedures, even in light of the, the new information that we have from the stock assessment. Here's an example of um, the operating model where the blue are sort of summary statistics of all four of these models combined. And that is the dark blue is the median trajectory with the black dark um, projection into the future under an SPR of 43% constant um, uh, SPR strategy. And the shaded area in blue and then the um, dashed black lines are sort of a 95% interval of the simulations that are produced. And what I really want to show you on this plot, though, are these individual trajectories in um, green, red, and the dark color on the bottom there. But what you can see is in the projections, these individual trajectories uh, cover quite a wide range. They can vary over um, the projection period in sort of high spawning biomasses and go to low spawning biomasses as well. So even though you see this dark black line, don't consider that a um, individual trajectory that you might be on, but a median or an average of all these different simulations we produce in the MSE. And that is what we mean by a statistic or performance metric is how, how does the management procedure perform on average over all of this uncertainty. So another task in the program of work was related to implementation variability and uncertainty. And this is basically um, related to uncertainty in the future of the um, TCUI and I'll step through different mortality types um, to give you an idea of what this really means. So if we think about a management procedure that produces a TCY, um, say it's 52 million pounds, and then the commission chooses to adopt a TCY, and that may not be the same as the management procedure, say that's uh, 55 million pounds. And then the fishery goes out and fishes, and they actually achieve some mortality, and that may be more or less than what was adopted. And so let's say that's 53 million pounds. And then there's, for many of these fisheries, we have to estimate what that mortality was based on landings, based on observer programs, et cetera. And so that might be 52.5 million pounds. So you see that all these different steps result in some variability in the different mortality types. And so the implementation variability is just incorporating that into the simulation process. And what you can see, we have the different mortality types shown here in green and purples. And then in between moving from each of these mortality types is the, um, is the type of variability. And we have decision-making variability, that difference between what the management procedure suggests and what is adopted by the commission. And then we have perceived, which is the difference between either the adopted mortality limit or the actual fishing mortality and what is estimated and the realized uh, implementation variability. And we don't ever actually know the actual fishing mortality. We're always dealing with estimates in the real world. However, in the operating model, it does simulate an actual fishing mortality. So we can test um, what is the effect of estimation error in that mortality. What we'll be focusing on here in this program of work is the decision-making variability part of this. So we've provided three different options of decision-making variability. One is there's no decision-making variability. The adopted TCY is always the same as the management procedure suggested TCY. A uh, second option was the coast-wide adopted TCY is set the same as the management procedure but then is distributed subject to variability. So that distribution procedure isn't always followed exactly. It's, it's, uh, it might be distributed slightly different. And we call that the status quo because that's how uh, commission decisions have been performed in the past two to three years. And then finally, the, the last option here 
is the coastwide TCY may differ from the MP and the distribution of the TCY among regulatory areas may also differ from the, the management procedure or the distribution procedure. So as I noticed uh, or noted here is we're um, considering, oh, it didn't fade out, I'm sorry about that, but this option one is considered status quo. So all of the results that I'll be presenting today um, will use only option one. But if you do want to look at these other options, you can go to what was presented at MSAP 17. All of those results are available at this link, which is slightly different than the current MSE Explorer. So another framework task was estimation error. And um, this relates back to a, a, a comment or a slide by Dr. Cox yesterday that the SRB stated, let's not worry too much about implementing a stock synthesis model in the simulation framework. That is a, a lot of work that, that has to be done and it might not be um, fruitful. You can do a simpler approach. What we have done in the past and we continue to do today is the simpler approach of just simulating estimation error. And what that is, it's a very simple approach to simulating estimation error. It doesn't involve a specific simple assessment type model. But one area that we could improve in this is implementing a simple uh, stock assessment type model that the SRB um, did suggest in their recommendation. But for now, we're simulating estimation error, which the SRB has approved in the past. So those are the framework tasks. And um, before getting into the management procedures, I wanted to talk a little bit about the evaluation and how to evaluate these MSE results. So within the, the MSAB, we use the MSE Explorer a lot, and that has a lot of different axes to look at, a lot of different options to look at. But what we've done for now in preparation for the annual meeting is we've updated the MSE Explorer to be much more simple, focus in on the results and the decisions that need to be made, um, and be able to have a more close look at these management procedures rather than trying to explore all these different options. Um, if you do want to explore, you can always look at that link that I provided earlier for the MSAP 17. When evaluating the management procedures, we have those two set size limits and multi-year. We'll keep them independent. We're going to focus on some really priority, primary, coast-wide objectives, um, and then examine the regulatory areas in a very general way, not look at individual specific ones, but say what happens across regulatory areas if there's something unique or is there a regulatory area that behaves uniquely. We're integrating five distribution procedures that the commission um, uh, directed us to use uh, in yeah, previous, I think earlier this year. And then I just want to note that the MSAB agreed at their meeting not to consider additional objectives at this time, although we'll show you some, um, some results that may be of interest in the presentation. So before we get into the management procedures, and one thing that is, is useful to um, bring up with the commission is this objective 2.1, which is the objective of maintaining the biomass around the target. Um, we've developed, we did a lot of work in the past to develop a target of uh, SB 36%, which is associated with uh, a maximum sustainable yield given a lot of uncertainties. But what was noticed at MSAB is that there's a little bit of inconsistency between how we define the general objective and how we define the measurable objective, where the general objective says to keep the biomass around the target, suggesting you want to hit that target, and the measurable objective is maintaining the biomass above a target, where you don't necessarily need to hit the target, but as long as you don't go below that target more than 50% of the time. So we are suggesting a consistent phrase of above a biomass target, which would be consistent with other fisheries agencies. Um, and a, one concern was if we maintain it above a biomass target, would that meet um, Marine Stewardship Council certification? And yes, according to their wording of their principles, it would still achieve a MSC score of 100 for that item um, if maintaining it above a target. So I think, um, you know, the commission, it's worthwhile for the commission to maybe clarify this, but it may also be useful to have this discussion with the SRB um, in um, a more
are scientific and what looking at other fisheries agencies and exactly how they do define this. But I just wanted to note there is um, this discrepancy and the way we are interpreting this is maintaining it above that target would still pass. That management procedure would still pass. Okay, got all that out of the way. Let's get into the fun stuff now. And that is uh, looking at size limits. So this is the first management procedure that we were directed to investigate. And the commission directed the secretariat to investigate a 32 inch size limit, which is our current size limit for the directed commercial fishery. A 26 inch size limit and no size limit. So removing that size limit all, all together. And I wanna note that um, the improvements to the operating model also included um, the ability to accommodate any size limit. I know we've had a lot of discussion in the past about making assumptions. Well, we developed the operating model now to um, use retention, which can accommodate any size limit and produce meaningful results about discard mortality. So I think that's something useful to consider, whereas previous incarnations of the MSC framework were not um, able to produce those meaningful outcomes. Okay, so here's results. Let me walk you through this table because you'll see this type of table a few times. What we have along the columns are the different management procedures. So the A32 is a 32 inch size limit, which you can also see in this row. And then we have a 26 inch size limit going to the left and then no size limit or zero uh, even further to the left. Um, and what we also have as the SPR is a 43% for all of these management procedures. We did investigate other SPRs, but I'm not going to present those to you today. Um, I'll present some general results on different fishing intents. Now down the rows, we have the different objectives, and we've summarized this as four main, what we're calling uh, priority coastwide objectives. We have a bi biological sustainability objective of maintaining that relative spawning biomass above 20%. And we simply note whether that was passed or not. Um, we're not putting in numbers here specifically because these have a threshold and a tolerance. And if it passes, that means it passes and that management procedure is okay um, to look at. We also have this target objective, <clears throat> the relative spawning biomass of 36%. And again, we've noted that as a pass, interpreting that as maintaining it above the target more than 50% or at least 50% of the time. <coughs> so you can see all of these size limits pass those um, objectives. The remaining two objectives don't have real specifics associated with them, specific tolerances and thresholds. So we actually report the numbers so we can simply evaluate the differences between management procedures. The first one, median AAV and the TCUI, that's related to the variability. And just think about that as the average variability in the TCUI um, from year to year, um, or the average change that the TCUI would see from year to year. So for over a 10 year period, it might change 2% and then 15% and then 20%, and that average would be about 16%, um, an average change. And then the final objective is just simply reporting what the median average TCY is. Over all these simulations, what's the median TCY? In the short term, these last two are short term objectives. And what you can see is that these are just uh, values of 58.3 million pounds for a 32 inch size limit compared to 60.5 million pounds on average for a no size limit. So, it took a little time to go through that, but I think it's important because you'll see this table many times for different management procedures. Um, but the overall results for size limits are, you can see here, there's not much difference in the variability in the TCY. Those numbers are pretty close, maybe a slight decline as you remove the size limit. But the real key difference is there's about a 3.7 increase in the coastwide TCY when the size limit is removed. And a lot of that increase is actually gained by moving to a 26 inch size limit, 2.7% increase with the 26 inch size limit. So I wanna look at a, co a couple of other aspects of um, size limits. One is the long-term effects or yield associated with uh, removal of a size limit. And the reason we wanna look at this is this was part of the commission request was um, to look at long-term effects of size limits. 
what this plot is now showing is that percent difference in the coast wide TCY when you remove the size limit, comparing it to the current 32 inch size limit. So, for example, in 2023, the simulations show on average about a 7% increase in the coast wide TCY if you remove the size limit. So, for next year. And I just want to note this is very, uh, this is quite consistent with the previous size limit results um, that were presented, I think, three years ago now. Um, which was a real near-term look at the effects of size limits. So as you go over time, you see that the, the um, percent gain in yield when removing the size limit actually declines. And that's because it's really dependent on stock conditions. Right now we have uh, a lot of young fish coming into the stock. We have small weighted age and we have some really specific conditions, which in the long term we average over the range of conditions that might occur. So looking at the long term is a, is a way to look at, okay, what if um, uh, we didn't have many small fish in the, in the system? What if weighted age was different? What if recruitment was different? All those things. It's just an a integration of all these different possibilities or states of nature of the stock. And what you can see is there's still a gain in the yield um, in the long term with removal of a size limit. There's a slight probability that it could be no gain in the yield, but in general, there's a gain um, in the yield, and that's dependent on the current stock conditions. How long the gain is all due to doing away with this curve or that um, Partly, yes. Uh, it's also that there's there's always associated with this are gains in moving selectivity to uh, uh, to the left a little bit, which might actually maximize yield for recruitment as well. And that's where the long term comes into effect as well. But you'll see, I, I will show you the um, differences in this card mortality as well. So, a few other interesting outcomes with size limits is we saw similar results across all of the IPHC regulatory areas of increases in the short term yield, about 4 to 5.9% per each IPHC regulatory area. Details are in the document except for 2A, and that's because 2A, three of the five distribution procedures, 2A had a constant um, 1.65 million pound TCY. So it really couldn't change in response to the size limit since that was set as a constant value. The higher fishing intensity resulted in a larger percent increase when removing the size limit. Um, so instead of a 3.7, I think it was 4 point something percent at a SPR of 40 percent. And then we did some examination. What if the fishery targeted smaller fish or targeted larger fish for various reasons um, without a size limit? And the gains were reduced as they targeted larger fish, as you would expect, um, and were increased as they targeted smaller fish. But overall, those two sensitivities, the gains were still present in the TCY. And then related to the directed commercial discard mortality. So this is only the discards from the commercial fishery there was a 78% decrease in that um, coast-wide discard mortality when removing the size limit. And on average, in the short term, going from about three quarter million pounds to less than a quarter million pounds. Here's something to consider as well. And this is something Dr. Cox mentioned is um, the SRB recommended, you might wanna think about the economic implications if there's a different price for small fish. So what we want to look at here, and, and was actually of interest at the MSAB as well, what is the percentage of U32 fish that would now appear in the directed commercial catch if a size limit was removed? So way over here on the right of this plot is the current 32 inch size limit. And in blue is shown the O32 portion of the catch. And then the top of the bar is actually relative to the yield that you would get with 32 inch size limit. So of course that's 100% because that's equal. As we move to the left, we see different options of the size limit. And I'll focus right now on this one second from the right called no SL, which is just the zero size limit. And what you can see is that for the, this is only for the directed commercial fishery now, not the TCY. So the gain is about 5% compared to the current size limit. But, uh, but 
93% of that catch would be 032 fish, so another 7% of that yield would be under 32 fish. So now there's a there's some U32 fish that's coming into the landings. And um, what that means is that if there is a different price for U32 fish, that could have economic implications. So uh, I think that's basically what I'm saying here is that what we decided to look at is we didn't want to say what economic value of the fishery is, but instead we um, did some math to, to work out, uh, eliminate a lot of this specific price, but just look at the ratio of the price of a U32 to a price of an O32 to see if the value of the fishery would be equal or when it would not. And so what we can calculate is what the price has to be of a U32 fish relative to an O32 fish to have equal value in the fishery when we're moving the source level. I'll explain this plot real quick. This is the short-term equal value price ratio or EVPR on the vertical y-axis here. And then we have two options comparing no size limit to a 32 inch size limit and a 26 inch size limit to a 32 inch size limit, those comparisons. The white area of the plot shows uh, the U32 price as a fraction of the O32 price. So for example, a 50 here means for equal value in the fishery, the U32 price should be 50% of the O32 price. And you can see over all the simulations, that's about the average or median value from all these simulations. If the U32 fish were 50% of the O32 price, then you would have equal value in the fishery. <clears throat> but what I wanna show you is the green area, and that basically means that for equal value in the fishery, the U30 price is not important. And that is because there are cases where Moving the size limit may not decrease the landings of O32 fish. It just opens up a whole new segment of the population. And that happens very rarely in these simulations, but there are certain conditions where that could happen, but not very often. The purple area is now where you, you do increase the potentially the U30 numbers of U32 fish are greatly a, a great proportion of the landings. Therefore, you'd have to have a really high price, actually greater than the O32 price for U32 fish for it to be equal value. So I wanna note coastwide general in these short-term simulations, that didn't happen very often that you're outside of the white range. So, um, but then I noted also most of the time, if the U32 price was 25% to 75% of the O32 price, um, you would result in equal value to the fishery when removing the size limit. Also wanted to look at this statistic, the EVPR over time. So here it is for each individual year. So Dr. Hicks, when you say equal value to the, the, the fishery, are you saying we wouldn't lose any Economic value, what, what are you referencing when you say equal value? Um, exactly, is that compared to, so, so right now we have a 32 inch size limit, we land this many O32 fish, um, and they're all O32 and they get this price of say $7 a pound or something like that. And so there's some value to that fishery based on those landings. Now, if you remove a size limit, let's say you now have to take even though you increase the yield, say 3%, the TCY by 3%, you actually reduce the landings of the O32 fish because there's a lot of U32 fish you're catching now and have to land. But if those U32 fish get a, a less price, say 50% of the O32 fish, that could result in a, in a um, less economic value to the fishery because they're getting a smaller price by landing more small fish. So what this EVPR means is what does the price of a U32 fish have to be relative to an O32 fish such that the increase in the TCY or U32 fish, but you still have the same dollars coming back to the fish. 
took me a while to figure out. I had actually worked it out with the, the equations to, to get a good handle on this. So we wanted to look at this in the long term as well, but by individual years. And what we find similar to the yield gain is that the, um, the EVPR, the equal value price ratio, so this ratio of what the value, what the price of a U32 fish has to be, is dependent on stock conditions as well. <clears throat> and what you notice in this really near term is that this price ratio is actually quite low, is that you would get such a gain in yield that the, there would still be a lot of O32 fish in the landings in the near term. But as stock conditions change with different recruitment regimes, different weighted age scenarios, um, that, that price ratio can get up to say 70, 80%. Um, but over the long term, we again see that 50% on average is what the um, price ratio has to be for U32 fish to include 32 fish. Now, does, does the analysis assume full retention, no high grading? Get higher value fish? Yes, it does assume um, full retention. There's a little bit of loss uh, due to, or, or a little bit of discard mortality that's due to say lost year or going over um, uh, or at the end of a, a season when they have to do regulatory discards. Um, and that's just accounted for a small amount. And that's why when you saw the discard mortality without a size limit, it didn't go to zero. There's still a small amount of discard mortality. But overall, it does assume no high grading and all fish that are caught and are should be legally retained marketing. Does it include non-marketable as well? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by non-marketable, but I imagine well, it would. Lice or whatever. What's that? Like lice or? Oh, yes, yeah. it, it includes. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not really accounting for those those sorts of things in the simulation, but that is something worth considering. So, okay, so we have a couple of different looks at size limits and, and thoughts about it, including this uh, uh, value to the fishery, um, you know, and just that it's, uh, and, and this is related to what Dr. Cox said yesterday, sometimes removing a size limit has economic implications and the SRB wanted to sure the commission was aware of that. Okay, so the second management procedure we looked at was multi-year stock assessment. And um, this was a, a, a multi-year stock assessment in this sense is basically not conducting the full stock assessment every year and or update stock assessments, but doing something different in between those full stock assessments um, to determine what the TCY should be. And the commission suggested um, looking at this biennially and triennially and doing two options, remaining the same as in the previous assessment year by regulatory area, that's how we interpreted that. So the TCYs remain unchanged in the years without a stock assessment. And then also using a simple empirical rule to be developed by the secretariat where the TCY could change, but not using a stock assessment. And I just want to remind everybody that in these simulations, the FIS remains an annual survey. It's only the stock assessment that won't happen every year. So we went away and we thought about this and we thought, well, this is something of, of interest to us. And so we developed actually three scenarios uh, for this. And the first one, option A, is just no change in the TCY in those assessment years. Option B, which I think of as both, that's how I remember this, is that there's a change in the coastwide TCY and in the distribution of the TCY. And that uses this data to um, make those changes. So this, Dr. Cox mentioned this yesterday, the SRB was very interested in this one as well. And that is the coastwide TCY changes proportionally to the FIS index. So if the FIS goes up, the TCY goes up. If it goes down, the TCY goes down at the same percentage. And then the FIS and the distribution procedures used to then redistribute that among the regulatory areas.
I came to the assessment reasonably well. You see there's a little bit of loss of yield when holding that coastwide um, TCUI constant from year to year. Um, and th that's that trade-off between yield and variability as well. What is really interesting is the triennial. Um, and this is where the SRB was actually quite interested in this. Um, and it shows that the median average TCUI is actually the same or you know effectively the same in the triennial process where the coastwide TCY and the distribution are adjusted by an empirical rule related to the FIS index and the variability is reduced uh, quite considerably almost to the level that you would see holding the constant across years and remember this is an average variability across a 10-year period so um, you know it, we haven't investigated whether it changes a lot during an assessment year or changes more in the non-assessment years, but this is an average over that 10 year period. So overall, we have a similar TCUI with um, this option B for the um, empirical rule adjusting the coastwide end distribution and the triennial results in quite a significant decline or decrease in the, in the variability from year to year. So a couple other outcomes. The, the, um, Outcomes across regulatory areas were, were similar with a significant decrease in the variability of the TCY in each regulatory area with the triennial frequency. Um, and the, the outcomes across different fishing intensities were similar as well, except harvesting at a higher fishing intensity brings you closer to that spawning biomass target of 36%. So something the commission also asked us to do is work with the SRB on defining costs and benefits of multi-year assessments. And so we've provided a list of costs here and then the next slide a list of benefits. Some costs are um, without an assessment every year, there would be a loss of detailed management information and such things as stock status. And Dr. Cox mentioned that was really important for the bluefin tuna um, uh, when they first started the process of coming out of a very low biomass, they had to report stock status to different entities. And so they did a stock assessment, but they didn't use that stock assessment in the quota setting. But that is something for the commission to consider. Is in those non-assessment years, you would see the FIS index, you'd see how the FIS index changed, but you wouldn't see stock status in a decision table and all those types of detailed management information. There's a, a slightly higher chance of smaller stock size with a multi-year assessment, but again, it's still passing all of those objectives of maintaining the stock size around certain levels. These last three are only related to options A and C, where the coastwide TCY was held constant, and that is um, that in those non-assessment years, it may not follow stock trends. So holding a constant when we see a decline in the coastwide index of 18% might be worrisome to some or opposite. Um, it's potentially a small loss in yield uh, with these two options, as we saw in the um, table earlier. And then it might not meet distribution agreements, as I um, mentioned earlier. Uh, and that's only for option A, because you would be holding the TCY constant in each regulatory But there are a lot of benefits to the um, to the multi-year assessments as well, and and a lot of these were outlined by the SRB in their report. And we saw that there's <coughs> interannual variability in the TC line, and there could be some multi-year stability and short-term predictability in the TC line as well, especially with those constant approaches. Um, people would know, okay, it's going to be this for the next three years, for example. Um, using that annual FIS index would be a transparent process to determine the TCY in non-assessment year. So a lot of stakeholders I know are uh, look at that index uh, to get a feel for what is happening with the stock. So that's, um, I think, a useful thing to consider for developing an empirical rule. Um, there could be more focused assessment research without having to develop an assessment. You could focus on um, developing of the assessment rather than developing the documents related to the assessment. And there could be potential additional time to collaborate within the secretariat um, across various branches, for example. 
Uh, something the SRB noted was the triennial assessment frequency would be consistent with the current assessment cycle. And the multi-year approach has a precedent at many other fisheries commissions, as Dr. Cox mentioned yesterday. So what are some next steps? Well, one next step that we see is to update the harvest strategy policy. So I know that there's a harvest strategy policy page on the IPHC website, and there are two documents associated there. There's one which was uh, from 2019, and that is a draft harvest strategy policy. Um, and, and then there's also an interim, which is a more descriptive uh, or description of the interim harvest strategy policy that actually expired earlier this year. And so I, uh, we believe it'd be useful for these documents to be looked at, maybe identify where areas are complete and defined and what areas are not complete and defined. And um, that might help the commission uh, with future plans for the MSC and harvest policy work. So we have this summary table, which basically shows five distribution procedures. Down the center is our current status quo, an annual assessment, 32 inch size limit. To the left are um, reducing the size limit and to the right are increasing the multi-year frequencies. And so you can look across this table and see all of these have passed the, um, the, the objectives related to relative spawning biomass. And then you can see how the uh, average annual variability and the median TCOI changes across these. So I think this is a nice way to put all of these results into a really succinct summary for the commission to consider. And then finally, some recommendations um, to note the paper and then note that if there is a rev one, um, it, it changed considerably in the first two pages, uh, really focused the commission on the uh, outcomes of the MSC. Uh, for the commission to adopt the uh, operating model for use um, uh, in evaluating these management procedures in the presentation at the 99th annual meeting. Um, and then to agree to the following MSC priority coast wide objectives, which are those objectives that were listed in the table, those four objectives as priority objectives for the commission to consider, noting there are other objectives presented in the document. Related to each of those objectives are these performance metrics. And so for the commission to endorse those performance metrics related to those priority objectives. And then um, to endorse the following set of uh, management procedures for evaluation at the 99th annual meeting. So specifically looking at those five as a small set of management procedures that uh, the secretary and the SRB really feel are worthwhile for the commission to be considering at this time. And then finally, some details of the results. The uh, commission knows spawning biomass objective passed for all of these for SPR values ranging between 40 and 46%. Uh, removal of a size limit increases the short-term TCY by about 3.7%. Um, landings of U32 fish would likely decline, while U32 would increase without a size limit, um, and there'd be a reduction in discard mortality for the directed commercial fishery. Um, and that, uh, on average, the price, if the price of a U32 fish was about 50%, the price of an O32 fish, there would be an equal uh, value to the fish <coughs> with removal of a size limit. For multi-year assessments, uh, the biennial assessment frequency with empirical rule shows similar results to an annual assessment. And the triennial um, assessment frequency showed a similar coast-wide TCUI, but a significant reduction in the variability of that TCUI. And then note the costs and benefits that were presented earlier. Um, and with that, I can take any questions. Um, yeah, I imagine there might be a few questions. Um, so, um, would your conclusions on the size limit uh, be different uh, with the incorporation of this new mortality assumptions? 
Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Alderson. That, that is a great question. Um, and, you, you know, just to preface that a little bit is um, the assessment and the MSE are sort of always leapfrogging each other. Um, this operating models were developed in, earlier this year, actually early in the year, so that we could get the simulations done. And that's before the assessment work was really starting to be done for the full assessment. So it's a great consideration. Um, we have looked at this in terms of um, what are some of the outcomes of these specific models within the operating model, and we didn't find any real differences in how you might rank these management procedures. What might differ are the numbers in this table. Um, they, you know, the numbers might not be 17.2 and 17.8 percent. They'll likely be different. But the relative ranking of those, the patterns that we're seeing across this table are unlikely to change in any significant. It might not be a 3.7% gain in yield. I can't say what it would be, but um, it could be a 3.5 or a 4.2 or something like that. But in terms of the rankings and the overall results, yeah, I think they'd be consistent with uh, any updates to the outcome. Thank you. Is there a question again? Um, thanks for the presentation, Alan. Lots of interesting uh, information here. I had a couple initial questions. Um, I wondered for the size limit piece, you know, we've had a few just summary analyses of this, this issue and what it would mean in case of the fishery and variability from year to year and in a TCEY and so on. And I, I can't remember all of, I'm thinking of Ian's analysis, uh, maybe three years ago or something. Is there anything that you've generated here where that sort of significantly changes what we understood from that earlier analysis that we should be aware of? Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Davis. So just quickly, so when this microphone's on, you want the other side to be on, so that's why it's not coming out. Gotcha. So it's my <laughs> fault. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll work on it. A anyways, uh, great commissioner, uh, or great question, Commissioner Davis. And you know, when we when we did this, um, when we we got the first set of results for this MSE, um, that's always the moment of opening the package and hoping things make sense. And so the first thing we did was look at, okay, is this consistent with what we've seen in the past? So we looked at those really short term results, which was what that previous size limit was focused on, <clears throat> was if we changed it in this year, what would the, the results look like? And they were they were very consistent. We, we were surprised how close the results were actually in that there was about that 8% um, gain in yield in the, in the near, near term. And um, <clears throat> And even the percentage of U32 to O32 fish in the landings was very consistent. What is new about this analysis is those long-term effects. So now we're able to look in the MSE, sort of the feedback over time of changing the size limit. How does that um, change the distribution of the stock? How does that, um, when you factor in and integrate changes in weighted age and changes in recruitment machines, does that hold up? And what we found is that the yield gain in the size limit is actually quite dependent on current stock conditions. Is, are we in a different recruitment regime? Is weighted age large? Are fish growing fast or are they growing slow? And so the yield gains um, depend on that. And we presented it here as a range of variability across those yield gains, as you saw with those bar plots. Um, or the, the box that plots, and um, and so what you what you, we the general conclusion is, in the long term, you might not have as large a gains as you'd have in the near term. That the eight percent that we saw three years ago, or whatever that was, it might be more like three percent in the long term. Um, and also that there's a, a range depending on the current stock conditions, what trajectory you're on. You could have smaller or larger gains. But we did look, and I didn't present it here, at sort of what are the changes in the spawning biomass across regions? You know, is removing the size limit going to affect uh, region two or region three, region four? And the, the actual distribution of the stock was quite small. And I believe that's because an F43 is not really a very high fishing intensity.
for a stock like this that, that is as productive as it is. We saw in previous MSC results, we would need to probably go to an STR 40 or maybe even a 38 to, to bring the stock around that target to those to that target level of 36 percent on average. Uh, <clears throat> other questions, Neil? Um, this one's less of a question, but I guess um, final observation. So I think it's slide 10. Um, we talk about the, the language and the phrasing. And I think maybe this is sort of like a, a community <laughs> domestic policy issue. Um, but I think there's an important distinction here. So uh, a target versus a reference point above which we want to keep the stock some probability with some probability, I think will lead us to uh, different ways of managing. So um, the way that uh, I read this is that ultimately it will function as a point that we are trying to uh, manage in a way that keeps the stock above that point at least 50% of the time. So in Canadian language, that is an upper stock reference point. Mm -hmm. A target mm -hmm. is something we are aiming to keep the stock near to. So if we are below it, we would manage to put the stock back to it. If mm -hmm. we're above it, we could manage to move the stock down to it. Mm -hmm. I think the language is going to be really important for us. Um, <clears throat> and and I, I think the way that it's described here is, is more the former than the latter, i.e. It, it, this isn't a target um, in that we would be trying to always move the stock back to 36%, but rather that we want it to be at least at 36% half of the time. Um, so I think that's going to be something that we, we should make sure we are very clear about. Um, as we move to sort of the discussion among commissioners around, you know, are we ready to, to endorse these? May I respond? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Commissioner Davis. I, I really appreciate that comment, and um, I, I would be fascinated to be a part of that discussion as well. And I, and I think there's a number of ways to approach this. One is clearly defining what the upper stock reference point and the target would be in the sense and is 36% either one of those? So you could define it, you could clarify this, and you could also change what the target is. We could do evaluations to determine a reasonable target to manage the stock to, as well as a 36% maybe to manage the stock above. Um, and the, you know, the interesting thing about this is fisheries, a lot of fisheries management was based on, you know, uh, maximum sustainable yield and fishing at those types of levels. Um, and here we have a process, as with many other MSCs, where we're bringing in other objectives. Um, and sometimes those objectives um, pull at each other. You know, there's trade-offs between those objectives. And we found that with the MSAB in discussing the variability in the interannual TCUI. The MSAB was very keen to <clears throat> not fish the stock down to low levels so that the variability between years would be less. Um, other questions, Brad? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Alan. I was just wondering, <clears throat> we, right now we're doing a uh, review of the stock assessment every three years. And how does that incorporate into something like a biannual um, assessment. Like if you're, you, you fall into this position where you would be trying to do a review and it may come up with something like natural mortality and that would happen in between, right? So you get this new information. So uh, would you change the pattern or what are, we, what are we kind of thinking that way? Or are we just throwing things to the wall and see what sticks. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Degree. Um, I, that is a really good uh, question to ask. And I think 
if the commission was to move towards a biennial type assessment where you know the assessment happened every other year they'd have to think about uh, aligning that with the full and update type assessment and if, the, if they were going to use the assessment uh, if they were not going to do an assessment every other year then we might want to put a full assessment on that same track right now it's on every third year is a full assessment um, and I think that's why the, the SRB says, well, there's this inconsistency potentially. So have a look at a triennial frequency of the assessment. And instead of doing update assessments in those two intervening years, what what else could we do? We came up with this empirical rule to, um, to replace that update assessment. So yeah, if I'm understanding your question right, then it's a matter of um, aligning the assessment with the multi-frequency approach sure that they they are in alignment so that you are making changes to the assessment and using that assessment in here to make those decisions yeah that's right yeah i was just curious so, yeah. thank you um maybe i missed it in the presentation alan um, but i didn't hear what the benefits were, for example, for uh, a multi-year assessment, not from your simulations, but from the benefits of only doing it every three years, and what would that free up and staff down? Yeah, um, thanks, Commissioner Ryle. It, a, a really good question, and we haven't contemplated the exact sort of uh, things that we would be doing. But um, I do know that conducting the stock assessment is uh, a lengthy process every year. I mean, um, Dr. Stewart does a lot of work um, in not only in um, now this time of year creating the documents, but early in the year preparing for the June SRB and preparing for the September SRB, um, and then going right into the document preparations for there. So in terms of freeing up time, I think it would allow um, those times of the normal preparation for all those different meetings throughout the year for um, the quantitative sciences group to, to have some focus on other uh, other aspects of the management of Pacific Health that, that could be useful, such as, you know, the, we talked about close kin mark recapture. Um, that would be something that the quantitative sciences branch would, would be um, heavily involved in because it is highly quantitative. Um, or we could be, you know, examining and helping out the research grants with other projects. Or um, I think a lot of the research would come in to just improving the assessment process, uh, examining model weighting, having more freedom to, to do that and collaborate with other groups, for example. So I think there'd be a, a allowed time to do the, the projects. I know that Dr. Stewart probably has on his whiteboard in his office a long list of them that need to start checking those off. Right here. And I don't know if Dr. Stewart wants to weigh in on that as well. That's true. He said that's true. So <laughs> I think he's referring to the long list on his way. <laughs> um, to follow up from Neil's question, I think I heard you say that you'd be adding another objective potentially. And so I guess just an observation. Um, and then you can respond is that I find that we already have quite a number of objectives and also quite a number of performance metrics. And so my preference would be to go the reverse direction and really fine tune it to the critical ones that we need to have um, achieved uh, rather than adding more. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Rell, um, and I appreciate you allowing me to clarify that. Um, one way to go forward would be to define objectives. We can just continue to define objectives all day and not go get anywhere, as yes, we probably noted in the last 13 years of the <laughs> um, <laughs> But, um, but I, I think that is where um, looking at the harvest strategy policy would begin to identify what pieces are we missing do we have it well defined in terms of upper stock reference points, um, targets, and lower stock uh, lower stock reference points? I think is what you do call them. But 
and then con operational control points and, and just really refining that, having a good look at the harvest uh, policy and making sure we have the definitions we need and making sure we have a small set of objectives and making sure that that harvest policy does um, link or synchronize with the harvest policies of Canada and the US, the two parties, um, and that they can be interpreted as each country would like it to be. Thanks, Alan. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Uh, well, ultimately, you've asked us for uh, a few things to endorse. So I was going to make a few pitches. Um, first, with respect to the operating model. Um, I'm not sure that needs to be something that the commissioners endorse. Um, it's a pretty technical piece. Uh, and I think, um, you know, my understanding is it's been reviewed by the, by the SRB. Uh, it, it lives in a current form that reflects their input. Um, so I wonder if we can proceed acknowledging that the operating model functions and so, and has been reviewed by the appropriate scientific bodies with the expertise to do so. Um, so I don't know that I would have any real sort of depth and knowledge of that technical expertise to add much by way of endorsement. With respect to the objectives, um, I think you know we are interested in in having a set to work with at least for some period of time and and seeing how they serve us. Uh, and I think with, you know, the, the slight adjustments to the language, um, that this is a reasonable set to, to start with. Um, I do think it's worth confirming that these have a hierarchy, uh, in that essentially, if you don't meet the first one, um, which is about maintaining the long-term, uh, Spawning stock biomass above the biomass in a reference point, you're out, right? Mm -hmm. And similarly, if you don't meet the second one, you're out. Um, so I think that would be useful. Um, in terms of the hierarchy, I think we'd also like to propose that D might be above C. Um, in other words, placing a slightly higher priority on what the average coast wide TCEY is instead of placing more priority on the uh, annual changes to that. So we're interested to hear uh, responses on that. Um, but that otherwise with you know a bit of tidying up perhaps with, with bits of the language around these that uh, it's something we could use <clears throat> even if we sort of defined them as something to begin with, right? Uh, so that we can sort of begin to sort of assess their performance. Um, and then I think the, the last two pieces you were asking about, uh, the, the first of them is the performance uh, metrics. Um, so we talked about these a little bit yesterday uh, amongst ourselves. And um, I think the, the one thing that uh, I'd like to suggest is that with respect to the performance against um, B, that maybe we are more interested at again for an initial period of of reporting on the probabilities of meeting that objective rather than the pass fail, given that we have a bit of sort of feeling out to do about whether this is more appropriate as a target or as our language and upper stock reference is something to stay above. And that might give us a little bit of flexibility from a commission perspective around, you know, well, how, how, how strictly or rigorously do we want to stay above versus manage towards? That might give us a bit more information to support that kind of, of discussion. Um, <clears throat> On the NPs, um, you know, obviously we have, we are working towards um, resolution of how we're going to share the resource. Um, I think though that um, you know, you've laid out uh, a cross section of MPs that 
give us information about the performance across a range of relevant um, parameters. And so I think, um, you know, seeing how they perform and having you report on that at the annual meeting could be uh, useful. It may be that in light of wherever we land, we want to come back to that. But again, I think in the interest of progress and sort of seeing us land some of this and then be able to assess over time that there could be value in that. So those are my thoughts across the, the four pieces where you're looking for our um, endorsement and uh, certainly welcome thoughts from others. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Hayes, could we go back to a slide, I think it's 27, talking about the priorities that Neil just so under three, it says uh, priority coastwide objectives. Are those listed in priority or are those <coughs> all treated equally from the staff's perspective? Uh, Commissioner Alverson, I think this has, um, well, well, as I understand it, we've considered this in the past and the uh, um, staff has had uh, some uh, say on this in that um, A would be sort of in a hierarchy, A and B would be the top levels, and then C and D within the MSAP process at least are sort of looked at simultaneous to each other. Um, and from what I understand, uh, Commissioner Davis just talking about was to maintain that hierarchy of A must be passed. If that's not passed, you don't look further. And if it is, you look at B. If B isn't passed, you don't go further. Um, and then putting D to look at D and then maybe have B um, a little higher priority than the variability. Thank you. And so I, I will present them in that order of uh, A, B, D, C. And, um, that can't be. Uh, John. Uh, Commissioner Davis, thanks, Paul. Uh, and um, Alan for the presentation and Neil for the very thoughtful comments on potential directions forward. Um, we're at a bit of a transition point uh, on the U.S. side with a new scientific advisor. Um, me as a new commissioner, um, a lot of this uh, has been in development for a very long time. Um, I recognize, Paul, that you were interested in kind of nudging this along, getting this to something approximating resolution or clarity. Um, unfortunately, we're just not there on our side. We just need a little bit of time to digest this and, and process it um, before we can um, offer some views on, on the path forward. Um, I think the annual meeting is a good target for that, uh, but not prepared to offer endorsement or, or alternative suggestions on the items that the Secretary has teed up today. Yeah, I, um... Uh, fair enough, John. I think it's uh, clearly a lot to take in. And um, as you say, it's been under um, development for uh, quite a while, and uh, we've been involved throughout that period, and so have some familiarity with it for sure. Um, I guess, um, you know, the reason I raised this with you and Dave, I guess, over about two months ago was that I felt that we were needed to focus our efforts. And um, I think what um, Alan has suggested here, I think in Neil's comments um, about how we could do that would, would be a start. And I think as well, uh, we're in the midst of a negotiation around allocation. And so I think it's more prudent to make um, some decisions at the annual, not some, but make decisions at the annual meeting. And uh, that would allow us to figure out what we're doing with allocation, what may also focus the work that uh, gets undertaken in, the, in, in this MSE process. But maybe you'll, as a way ahead right now, maybe what we can do is um, capture the comments that um, Neil provided 
um, and incorporate that into the record and that could at least give you an idea of what we're thinking about. Yeah, I, I think that's really helpful. And again, I appreciate the thoughtfulness that you, you've commented on this. Um, we're just not in a position to say yeah or no. Uh, just need a little more time. Thanks. Thank you. Just to clarify one thing, because I, I think I was a bit confusing on one point, uh, Dr. Hickson, that um, uh, with respect to B, um, I think we're depending on where we go, right? I mean, obviously, here the U.S. is interested in sort of reflecting on this a bit more, but just to sort of make sure we're clear on what our current thinking is, uh, not as a pass-fail, but rather as a reporting on probabilities. In other words, if it were placed second in that hierarchy, it's not that we would necessarily be screening any out, so much as, it, as positioning it as you know, a place of importance. But by, by reporting on it as probabilities, <coughs> There wouldn't be anything screened out at that step, but rather it would show us the performance at that step. So just wanted to make sure I didn't confuse matters on that on that one detail. Thank you. Can I add one more to that list too? Um, I guess it's down in the performance metrics. I mean it's the median average annual variability on the TCUI. Um, we were thinking that it would be better not to have the median, but um, Just really switch it to a mean. And I guess the reason for doing that is I think for, for our delegation, but also for myself, it's more to I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Rail. Um, reporting, well, first of all, the calculation of AAB is uh, very common in fisheries. I think we've seen that in many different management strategy evaluations. And that calculation occurs for one single trajectory that's simulated in one state of the population over a 10-year period. And that is the mean um, variability over that 10-year period. And then what we do is we calculate that mean over the 10-year period for, say, a thousand different simulated trajectories. And over that thousand simulated trajectories, we then calculate the median. So it's a median average variability. Um, I just want to make sure that we're clear on exactly what all this means. Now, when we calculate that over the thousand different simulations, we have a distribution. We can calculate the median, the mean, the quantiles, the, the what, 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 whatever, what, whatever the, the commission thinks would be most useful. Um, the median is typically reported because that's sort of the center of it, um, more of a neutral type of concept. Um, the mean can be affected greatly by um, extreme quantities in there, it can be pulled up or down. Uh, so I think from a scientific point of view, I would prefer maybe uh, reporting if the commission desired the mean, maybe having an idea of how similar far the median is from that as well to get an idea of what we call skewness of that distribution. Is it have a long tail or something like that? Um, so, um, but yeah, if we can report the mean just as easily. Yeah, well, I guess um, you provided your explanation, maybe another way of sort of compromise, if you will, is for providing the quantiles, if you will. Yes, and um, that is uh, a, something the MSAP has requested in the past. And the Sea Explorer, um, we do have those quantiles from that to give an idea of the more of the range of the AAB, which I think is uh, very informative as well. Any other comments, questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so, so knowing there's no other questions or comments from, from commissioners, I'm just trying to 
capture a way that where the secretariat is able to move forward between now and the paper deadline of the 24th of December for, for the annual meeting. Um, so if I can try and summarize, and please do correct me where I think uh, you've all landed, is that you're going to acknowledge that the MSC operating model has been reviewed by the SRB and is performing well. It, and I'm going to make a proposal for the um, coastwide objectives that the Commission is either noting that the following MSE priority coastwide objectives recommended by the IPAC Secretariat uh, will be used as part of the uh, analysis that we're going to provide between now and the annual meeting. <coughs> For the performance metrics that you are simply noting, uh, the following performance met metrics associated with the coastwide objectives as recommended by the Secretariat uh, and that will allow us to, to move forward between now and the 24th. And then similarly for the management procedures, noting that there is a, a large number of management procedures that have been put forward by the MSAB, that the Commission, and there's two options here, you can simply, uh, Commission noted that the Secretariat intends on focusing its efforts on the following management procedures or alternatively that you formally agree that the following set of reduced management procedures will be analyzed between now and the end. Thank you, Jim. John? I'm not sure I understand the implications for the Secretariat's work in trying to clarify these points, but what you're describing and to me sounded like acquiescing to, you know, okay, move forward. And we're just not there. So that's that's where I'm getting tripped up. If I may share. Um, so, so I guess maybe that's something that over the coming weeks we can seek additional clarification of what you would like the Secretariat to put forward for consideration at the annual meeting. We can certainly put up uh, what's been presented here at the interim meeting, but it would, it would just help us greatly to try and focus those efforts uh, to get the commission uh, a little further on. But if, if that's not possible, uh, then, then maybe that's the case. We, we pause and we'll wait for that further direction. Yeah, and I guess that would be my follow-on question. Just, you know, can't we just defer this as it, as it was teed up for today, uh, and it teed up in the same manner? Um, Dave, were you proposing that there be more work done between the end and the end? Thanks, Chair. It, it's more a case of um, what we could potentially do because we have two full months of, of, of balance time between now and the annual meeting. We have uh, about 23 days before the paper is due. Uh, and so this paper could simply roll over for the annual meeting. But it's, uh, and I guess maybe this is a, it's a question for Alan as well, if there's any other refinement that could be useful. Thanks, Dr. Wilson, and um, thanks for the discussion. I, I, I think for me, this is very helpful in how I should present these results. So we've done a lot of work in producing these results. And um, <clears throat> as we've learned, I can come in and and a whole bunch of stuff that makes no sense to anybody. <laughs> um, but what we would like to do is really focus the result on what the commission desires. And this presentation for the interim meeting was an attempt to do that. So what we're looking for from the commission is, is this a reasonable way to present the MSC results at the annual meeting to help the commission make the decisions that they need to make? So we're looking for just guidance on what the commission would like to see in the report. Was the report for the interim meeting um, useful in the way it was presented or is there advice on how to rewrite that? And also, is there something that the commissioners say, what well, would be really helpful in the next two months? Could you go away and report this differently or show us the 25th or 75th quantiles of AAP or, or something like that? Just just guidance on how the commission would like to um, receive these results in the future. We can't go in and modify the operating model right now or really do many more simulations. That's just too time consuming. But how
how we present it to the commission in the, the best way as well it would be really helpful. Okay, so um, it sounds like because of the publication deadline for the materials for the end, you're really talking about a few weeks from now. Um, so um, we can try, we can see if, there, if there's any thoughts we have on any areas of clarification for how the material is presented or additional information that we would like to see, that sort of thing. If we have anything like that to get it to you within that time frame. Um, but uh, absent that, I, I guess my preference would probably be to just, just carry forward what we've got for, uh, for, for the discussion. <clears throat> carry forward with the present presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would, would it be okay to include the quantiles going forward in what you are Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, you know, anything along those lines in terms of clarifying the implications or, or uh, illustrating how the information would be used and applied, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to make sure we're on the same page as far as the um, suggestions that Neil was presenting are we agreeable to those as, as well, or just to how the information is presented? Because he was, you know, uh, um, highlighting some, I guess, focus on the on the objectives and some the changes there, and so those are probably more substantive. Yeah, they are. Um... I don't, I don't know if, um, to, to get at you know, Neil's points about the, the semantics of how things are phrased and the implications of best intelligence, and that's where I think that could help illustrate possibilities in the presentation, something like that, but without it just kind of steering it in a particular direction. Okay. What if it was just, um, you know, this presentation with, and here were some, uh, here was the feedback from the interim meeting. Proposed adjustment here, proposed adjustment there, this one, no, not, not, none of it presented as recommendations uh, or even the commission's advice, but rather simply feedback. So that when we get to the annual meeting, <coughs> we have the, uh, information you presented here today, Dr. Hicks, and some kind of like recap of this is the this was the nature of our discussion from the interim meeting. These were some of the points raised that we are coming back to you to seek further discussion or direction on. And we don't kind of lose this, um, but we aren't kind of committing ourselves to anything either. Is that something you think we could work with? Yeah, I, I appreciate the spirit of it, 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 it and I don't want to uh, split hairs, uh, <laughs> but it, it, you know, it sort of implies that it, that's giving some direction. Uh, so maybe their uh, initial observations or something along those lines, you know, something to indicate that it's not meant to indicate direction for the back Yeah, I don't think Neil is suggesting that it, we are going to capture it in this report for this meeting too. And so you'll have a chance to review that and comment. Um, and that will help, I think, for a Van Allen to make a presentation that gets posted to Okay. Um, just an overall comment. I think um, the briefing note that was put together was very helpful um, to explain uh, and try to focus uh, on a number of areas and provide the rationale. I found it very useful. So thanks very much. Um, so if there's nothing else, we can move on um, to item number eight. Great, thank you very much. And so this will be by, presented by Dr. Hutchinsack uh, as she comes up and gives her that presentation brought up. Nice. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay. So I'll now present the agency industry regulatory proposals. And this will include the received proposals as well as proposals that we expect to receive for all consideration in the 2022-2023 regulatory process. But I'll start with a couple of uh, reminders. Uh, the fishery regulations proposals can be submitted to the IPFC through uh, fisheries regulation uh, portal. Uh, this is a fifth year of full electronic submission of uh, proposals. And I will note here that we uh, this year updated this portal. So if you haven't seen it, please I have a look at the that simplified from way to, to interact uh, with the Secretariat uh, when it comes to uh, regulatory proposal as well as the statements of regulations and proposals. As a reminder, the deadline for submitting regulatory proposals is 30 days. And uh, for the upcoming annual meeting, the deadline will be uh, 24th of December. And uh, we'll note that we'll not be accepting any regulatory proposals submitted after this deadline. So we recommend to make sure that if, uh, anybody who wants to submit the proposal adheres to this deadline. And on top of that, we'll be also accepting stakeholders' comments on IPC fishery regulations or published regulatory proposals. And this is um, accepted un until the day before the IPC sessions. All the proposal, uh, all the comments will be collated by the Secretariat and presented to the Commission. Uh, I will start with the uh, fishery proposals uh, from uh, fishery regulating regulations proposals from the Secretariat. Uh, the first two uh, provide the Commission with an opportunity to recall the format of the IPC fisheries regulations, in particular sections five and section uh, section five and nine, and this relates to mortality and fishery limits as well as uh, commercial uh, fishing period. Uh, this, uh, these two proposals are uh, more of a uh, placeholders and will be filled with uh, uh, based on the decisions of the Commission uh, at the annual meetings. So really it's, it's about the format of how this will be built into regulations, um, after those uh, decisions related to civic health officials. Uh, the proposal uh, A3 uh, is intended to accommodate the transition of management in the IPFC regulatory area to A from IPFC to the Pacific Countries Management Council and the fisheries. Uh, this proposal affects section 14 and 15 of the regulations, as well as have some implications for other sections just because it's a, it's a significant change to, to the whole uh, document. Uh, this um, change is related to, uh, to the transition that was already described uh, in agenda item 3.2. And I'll also point you to more information on the transition uh, that is provided to, to the Commission in the information paper. It includes an out, um, outreach brochure that informs the background of this action, as well as where it currently stands. The fourth uh, Secretary's proposal is intended to improve clarity and consistency of the FHC special regulations and include minor amendments specifically uh, on just the writing of uh, in the regulations. And this is a proposal that is typically prepared in collaboration from different parties that, that are reviewing the fishery regulations documents together with the Secretary to make sure that. Um, the document is easily readable and well reflect on the intentions of each uh, section. Moving forward, we have um, contracting parties proposals. Uh, proposal B1, this is a proposal that is not submitted yet, it's what it is expected as a part of. Uh, a follow up from the decisions of the uh, December North Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting action. Uh, and this proposal uh, will provide the charging management measures reflecting reflect the fishery limits and uh, uh, will be applicable to IPC regulatory areas 2C and 3A. And uh, this proposal, as I said, um, 
will be expected to be available to the commission after the December meeting and will be presented in more detail by the contracting party at, at the annual meeting. Proposal B2 is related to uh, uh, daily back limit in IPFC regulatory area to B. And I believe that we have a uh, Mason from Canada who is available to uh, present this proposal in more detail in the collection. Um, go ahead. Okay. Right, um, just to sound check, can everyone hear me? Okay. All right, great. All right, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gwen Mason. I am the incoming Halibut coordinator with Swift Devo, taking over from Maureen Finn. Um, so I'm going to quickly speak to the regular proposal submitted for Area 2B with regards to uh, having a flexibility to have a bag limit to three per day. Maureen has previously spoken to this proposal a couple of times, I believe, most recently at the special session 12 in February 2022. Um, so she provided a pretty comprehensive presentation, which you can find in the meeting materials there. So I'll speak to that at a high level, but um, if you'd like some more detail, feel free to check out Maureen's presentation. So to provide a high level summary of the proposal request, Canada is seeking to amend um, section 28 of the IPHC uh, fishing regulations to allow up to a maximum daily bag limit of three fish per day in the domestic recreational sector in Canada. Uh, the current bag limit constrains Canada's ability to be flexible in making critical in season decisions uh, to the fishing plan in order to support meeting TAC goals and um, domestic fishery objectives. Um, there are many aspects of Canada's management um, of the recreational fishery that does give us confidence in our ability to effectively manage it. Um, Maureen has provided these, but just to recap and refresh everyone's mind, um, Canada has a defined recreational allocation, defined daily limits, possession limits, annual limits, and size limits. Um, we have comprehensive and timely in-season catch monitoring. This is through a variety of programs, including IREC estimates, creel survey responses, uh, logbook responses, and there is also independent validation of catch estimates that is completed at the docks and, and through overflights as well. Um, in season, there is uh, proactive and responsive management flexibility. Canada is able to vary the daily limits in season uh, through a variation order in order to manage catch. Um, we're also able to generate a comprehensive catch estimate on a monthly basis. And there is a catch overage provision in Canada's recreational fishery as well. So just to give a brief overview of Canada's recreational fishery, um, Canadians uh, and, and those planning to fish recreationally in Canada gain access to recreational halibut through a BC Tidal Water Sport Fishing License. Um, approximately 275,000 of these are issued annually. And the fishery occurs through tidal waters, as the, the license would suggest. Um, and there is minimal catch and effort throughout the Strait of Georgia. The fishery is managed as one coastwide fishery, roughly divided into four subregions. Haida Gwaii, North Coast, Central Coast, and South Coast. There is no differentiation between guided and unguided components. Uh, but lastly, there is also a domestic sharing arrangement of the Canadian FCEY between the commercial and recreational sectors, with 85% uh, designated for commercial and 15% designated for recreational purposes. As far as catch monitoring goes, um, overall, catch monitoring occurs over these large uh, geographic areas. There are numerous remote areas that are included as well, and in, that encounter both guided and non-guided anglers. DFO invests significantly in staff and resources towards the recreational catch monitoring and reporting. Um, and this also includes a couple of newly funded positions that were created earlier this year to review recreational catch monitoring regimes across all fisheries. Um, DFO obtains recreational catch and effort data through field surveys, logbook, uh, logbook entries, and internet surveys. DFO also comply or compiles recreational catch and effort data into a comprehensive uh, catch estimate by area on a monthly basis. Um, and we work continuously and closely with the Sport Fish Advisory Board, or the SFAB, to strengthen the recreational fishery monitoring and catch reporting in the Pacific region. The SFAB has a catch monitoring working group that regular meet, regularly meets with DFO catch monitoring experts 
and fishery managers throughout the coast throughout the year. Um, in more new stack, I'll, I'll keep the, the various aspects of catch monitoring relatively high level today, but there is more information about those three different options um, in more new stack from special session 12. So what I, I think folks are probably most interested in is how has it been going this far? Um, just to, to refresh folks, for the past two seasons, um, a temporary flexibility has been provided to Canada annually by the Commission on an annual basis. So it was provided in 2021 and then in this season. Both in 2021 and in, in 2022, this current season, this flexibility has been utilized. Um, and so for 2021, the flexibility was brought into place on September 10th. Um, and this is when the realized catch was below that which was forecasted. The increased, um, there was an increased catch in September because of this. Um, and this was compared to original forecast amounts at two per day. But for the following months um, where catch and, and effort usually goes down anyway, um, these remained below the original forecasted months for the remainder of the year. The total catch for the season last year in 2021 was 802,266 net pounds. This equated to be just over 85% of the TAC and was um, just over 71,000 net pounds below the original forecasted amounts. Uh, this season in 2022, this flexibility was utilized on August 20th um, for the remainder of the 2022 season. Um, this did result in an increased catch for both August and September compared to the forecasted amounts originally. Um, however, we do not yet have the data for October or November. I believe the October data probably came to us yesterday, so I, I haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet. Um, total catch to September 30th is sitting at 924,829 net pounds, and this is approximately 91.4% of the TAC. Um, and as of right now, it is um, about 55,500 net pounds above original forecasted amounts. Um, however, this is demonstrating that the flexibility does allow Canada the opportunity to harvest its recreational TAC when the fishers fish conservatively throughout the front half of the year. So we do also have in our forecasting model the ability to move the remainder forecasted amounts either up or down by a percentage base to see what any changes might be. Um, and after September, even at a 200% increase of forecasted amounts for the remainder of the year, which is highly, highly unlikely, um, catch is expected to be at 96.5% of the THC. And note that the catch is expected to be much less. A lot of most catch and effort tends to fall after Labor Day and especially after September. So we're not expecting to see anything around those numbers. So just to wrap up, why, why does Canada support uh, the requested amendment flexibility to allow a daily limit of maximum three per day? It's another tool in our management toolbox that we have to be able to effectively manage our domestic recreational fishery. Um, so as a reminder, Canadian recreational fishery has a defined allocation, defined daily limits, possession limits, annual limits, and size limits, comprehensive and timely in-season catch monitoring throughout a variety of programs, plus independent validation of catch estimates, in-season proactive and responsible management flexibility, the ability to generate comprehensive catch estimates on a monthly basis, and a catch overage provision. So just to conclude, um, our recommendation is that the commission note the IPHC fishery regulation proposals, um, of proposal B2, which proposes the daily bank limit of up to three fish per day per person in the recreational fishery and IPHC regulatory areas to be. And that was a lot of information. I apologize, but I, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Uh, thanks for walking through that. And I, I especially appreciate the how has it been going uh, mm -hmm. emphasis. Um, so I gather that the intent, consistent with what you described about how it's been going, is primarily to use this at the tail end of the season, sort of a, a cleanup to help assist in, in the, getting towards the quota. Um, and and I, I guess I'm wondering if you've considered some sort of sideboard language or something like that to illustrate that that's the intent. But you know, not surprisingly, uh, I'd anticipate some interest from uh, U.S. charter sector folks uh, in what this does for marketing if, if uh, Canadians are marketing you know, three fish per day and, and the U.S. side is not. So. 
Thank you, Commissioner Kerland. Um, I, I hesitate to to phrase it as a, a, a kind of cleanup effort at the end of the fishery. The number one goal of the recreational sector in Canada is to ensure an entire fishing season. Um, and the SFAB and their recreational halibut working group is extremely conservative and precautionary in the forecasts that they do develop at the beginning of each year. And they are they would much rather fish conservatively throughout the majority of the year and then open it up if there is that opportunity, then start out really, really high with a bank limit of up to three per day at the beginning of the year. Um, there is the ability to vary the bag limit up or down at any point throughout the season. So if, uh, if Canada had chosen to move to three per day and we saw the catch estimates kind of way higher than we expected and we expected that it might reach our TAC, we would vary that back down as well. And then how about the marketing aspect of that? Is this uh, something you considered in, in analyzing the implications of this regulation proposal. So I I will admit um, I am a bit naive and have new to this file. Um, however, it, it's from my viewpoint, it, it's it's a, a domestic management tool that we would be able to utilize if, if, if we could and if we could. Yeah. So I have a couple questions. Um, so I understand you do have a bag limit of two fish, uh, and both have some uh, constraints uh, as to size. So how more effective will, do, will a two fish the two fish bag limits do to your you know ability to harvest uh, your allocation if you uh, liberalized the size restrictions on those two fish so right now you're you know you have one small one one big one but you, i mean if you went to two fish of any size you would get your attack pretty quickly without the need for a three fish bag on it so that's my first question and the second question was you mentioned that in at least the last year, you had a little more data on the use of the three fish at the end of the season, and that there was an increase in the harvest at the end of the season. Were you able to tease out whether that was strictly due to the three fish bag, or was it due to an increased effort, uh, like more anglers fished um, than the previous year? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Yamada. Um, to, to address your first question, the in-season or pre-season forecasting that goes into determining what type of size limits we have with associated bag limits, I believe there are 15 or 20 different forecast models that are applied and then discussed at the Grandpa Shellfish Recreational Work Meeting um, in the beginning of January. And that group then decides what avenue they would like to take. So prior to the three per day limit that was enacted this season, both this season and last season, the, the size limits associated with the bag limits were either one large fish um, or two small fish under a under 90 centimeters. So anglers had that flexibility to decide if they wanted to, to get the big one or, or, or if they would like to, to retrain more smaller fish. So different size limits and, and what that is forecasted to uh, be in terms of realized catch are, are considered every year and and, and anglers stakeholders um, provincial representatives and um, federal representatives meet on that at the beginning of january and together vote on which model to, to go with going forward so I, I'm sure I, I have not done the forecasting. Uh, we do have a new member on our team that is the, the lead recreational coordinator who is starting to dig into that data now. Um, but I can take a look at if any forecasting to date has been done, anticipating what a three per day might do. I, I am assuming that forecast models would include that going forward and would add to the list of ones to be considered by the group at the beginning of the season. Um, and then just to answer your second question, um, the, the, unfortunately the short answer is, is 
the data that we collect, it's it's only on a monthly basis. We're not able to, to tease out whether or not it's um, the increased cash that we're seeing is result of effort. We, we would be able to take a look at the number of landings and the number of reports that had come in and make some some assumptions that way. But it, it's, it's difficult with the data that we have of whether or not this increased catch that we've seen over the last couple of months since we enacted it in August was due to the increase in three per day limit or due to an increased effort. And I, I, I'm sure that those are those two probably go hand in hand a little bit as well. Anglers would be likely more likely to, to head out a bit later in the season if they knew that they were able to retain more fish. So I'm sure it's, it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah, follow up. Yeah, yeah. So um, back to my first question. Uh, so we, I, uh, what I gather is that these size limits are set uh, way in advance and probably don't have the flexibility to, to change those sizes in season. Is that correct? No, once they are set, once the once any limits are set and printed on the license, they right. cannot be varied in season. Okay, so if you added to that license a three fish. How do you perceive that to be done? Like you can catch one fish of any size, two fish of these size, or three fish of these size. Is that going to be how that would roll out? So the bag limit, the daily limits in terms of one per day, two per day, three per day are not written on the license because we want to be able to retain that ability to change that in season via variation order. Um, the consideration of if it's three per day, you could catch three fish under this size or, or whatever consideration that they would take into account of three or two or one would be included in those forecasting models that would be developed. Forecasting models, but you would not know when that might be implemented. Correct, yeah. Uh, so, um, great. We don't want to be the analyst then. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the information. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Oh, yeah. Well, maybe just a comment to sort of like draw this all together, at least in the way I, I think of it. Essentially, we've made the costs for the recreational sector exceptionally high for hitting or exceeding their TAC. If they've got a they've got a defined TAC. <clears throat> we monitor the catch month by month and we forecast for the remainder of the season. If our forecasts start to show at some point that they're going to hit their TAC, we will close the fishery. And we have. We have closed their fishery uh, at least a few years within the last 10. And then most recently have added an overage provision. So if they do go over their TAC, we're going to take it off their TAC the next year. So, you know, the, the, the short story is that they have a lot of incentive not to go over their TAC. And the result is at the beginning of the year, they tend to plan very <coughs> cautiously because to them, uh, their priority is to maintain the longest season possible and not get closed um, early. And this is what creates the scenario that Gwen has been describing, where the beginning of the season is intentionally set not to get to the TAC because the cost of getting there is, is so high. Hence the need for some way to adjust in season such that they have the opportunity to fish as much of the TAC that is defined for them as possible without getting to that point. And that's where this tool comes in. The focus on this tool is because, as, again, as Gwen was saying, the other tools we have cannot be adjusted in season. So the size limit on the license can't be changed. Annual limit on the license can't be changed. So this is the one, this is the lever we can turn up and down. If we were to begin the season with something like two fish any size, the likelihood of them getting to their TAC much faster than they would wish is is pretty significant. So that's kind of, that's what sort of brought us to this point. John, you know, can I, I just ask you a follow up on that from sort of an operational perspective? Is there um, is there a reason why this couldn't be 
uh, kind of time limited but, or, or, or um, the intent clarified that it's primarily to be used towards the tail end of the season for helping to achieve the TAC without exceeding it? I think the challenge there is that we don't know when such an adjustment might be appropriate. Um, and just to sort of provide an example, in 2020, you know, that season unfolded in a way that was very unexpected, right? And uh, I don't remember where they ended up, but they were, you know, well under their TAC. And so how each season unfolds has been different if we look at history. Um, that's sort of the extreme end of the, the spectrum. Um, so, you know, I, I think we'd struggle to define a point beyond which we'd be able to use the tool. We'd, we'd be limiting ourselves um, in that if the season unfolds in a way we did not forecast and we had said we won't use this tool until X date, um, or we have to come back to have that discussion, it, it could constrain our ability to support that sector's opportunity all within the allocation that's actually been defined for it. I think that's where we're a little hung up. Is if that, that point could fall somewhere in the middle of the summer, somewhere towards the end of the summer, we just don't know. Yeah, thanks, that's helpful. And then uh, do you have any thoughts on the, the uh, stakeholder marketing concern that I raised? Um, I could tell you that uh, the likelihood of us using this tool on day one is, is pretty much zero. So the ability to market that in advance for um, you know, lodges or guides that are making their pitches in the coming months for what's on offer in the year and people booking trips, probably pretty limited. Um, I think the way this has been envisioned is as an in-season tool. Um, and so uh, you know, I'm not the expert on how responsive markets are to hey, guess what, the limit's just been changed to three. If you come next week, you can take advantage of that. I, I, others would have lots more to say about that in terms of expertise. But I, my, my other observation would be that um, I think it's a very, uh, I think there's danger in us deciding that collectively uh, we're going to step into the world of making decisions that reflect you know sort of marketing considerations when really things like this are about a TAC is defined we have the ability to monitor a fishery towards its progress towards it and this is about providing an opportunity for a sector to fish their TAC I think that's to me that's sort of our primary objective I I worry about um, what it would mean to start wading into you know, comparing the nature of an opportunity that one sector has compared to another, because there are so many ways that each fishery in each area can be different. And, and if we're aiming towards consistency, I, I don't think we can get there and I don't think we should or need to. So those are some additional one commissioner thoughts. <laughs> you know, I would just add a few to what maybe there's repeating, but um, as Wynn said and Neil said, there's a lot of effort done in February to make sure that um, they reach their overarching objective with which they have a three year round. That's, that's their goal. And this is a tool that provides some flexibility in season. And um, the reluctance to, you know, indicate or stipulate that it would only be applied in the end of the season, I think it's unnecessary. For the reasons that Neil spoke of, um, the data is collected, uh, analyzed a little monthly, which is another somewhat of a restriction too on how quickly you can react. Right. So, given how they are precautionary for all the reasons Neil talked about, the limits that we go on the license are set so they don't go over. And then when we start looking at the data. July, second week of July, second week of August, that's when we get our, start to see whether it's flexibility. And generally, you know, by that time, um, people have made their choices of what they're going to do. 
that's why um, from how we have structured the recreational fishery at BC with the limit, and numerous other restrictions, um, this provides them some flexibility to get the EC that's been identified for them. Um, yeah, sorry, Richard. Just a comment. Um, this has uh, maybe far reaching implications if this was adopted by Canada for our fishery in, in Alaska. In that um, I would assume that our fishery is divided into guided and unguided. The unguided or the local residents or people that take, take a, a boat rental. They're not restricted like the charter fish. So they can catch two fish of any size right now. And um, that's been a concern because they, they're not restricted, uh, but they're constricted by the, how the regulations of two fish. I can imagine that if Canada went to three fish, I would say that these unguided anglers would want to have the same kind of consideration and they would ask for three fish. But their fish are not restricted at all. They could catch three fish of any size, you know, uh, and that might, you know, they ought to be an issue in our fishery, the recreational fishery. Um, sorry, I mean, it's a concern of ours already in that, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to look at how we can equal the playing field. Uh, you know, if somebody on our guide vessel, they can catch one halibut of 40 inches and they can rent a boat from the same operator and catch two fish of any size. So that discrepancy has really um, shifted effort. There's been more effort into the unguided sector. So this would just add to the potential fire that's already brewing in Alaska. So. Yeah, thanks for that. This is this is the exact issue, right? So back to your question, John, the ways that each fishery are different. So that fishery has no TAC. There's no in-season monitoring. Um, and there's two fish of any size. Three key features that are like very distinct from the way that the fishery is managed in in, in BC. And I could easily see <clears throat> members of the recreational sector in Canada saying, we want to do away with the catch limit. And we would love to be able to fish two fish of any size. So sort of aiming towards the consistency of how the measures that are defined for each fishery, I think, is elusive. To me, the response to interests like that <clears throat> would be about the conditions under which uh, changes to the way a fishery is designed could be supported, right? And so uh, what features of a fishery design might you need to have in place to enable that kind of additional flexibility? So that's why we've been trying to be really explicit about what we think we have in place that enables that kind of flexibility. And I think if that were an, an issue that came up, uh, I, I hope that those would be features you could point to to provide a rationale for why does this why is this viable? Why does this make sense in a 2B context? Um, what distinguishes the way the fishery is managed there compared to the way the fishery is designed or managed for the unguided sector in, in Alaska? Um, I, I think this idea of of consistency is, is going to be perpetually over the horizon. Um, but the attempt to sort of constrain ourselves on, on certain features are going to be a real challenge. All right. Thanks, Neil. And thanks very much, Gwen, for going through the process. That's good. Um, so Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so I've, I've heard that uh, the idea of a marketing advantage a couple times, notwithstanding uh, you know, <coughs> wading into that with um, Neil's comments, but I've never seen any evidence. It's been around for two years. I've not seen any evidence of guys marketing three a day. Um, 
Is has anyone seen evidence of that? Uh, like, is this a real concern or is this a concern that um, <clears throat> it's about other issues? Well, since, since I brought it up, I, I just say I was interested in knowing whether that is was a consideration in the analysis and formation of the proposal, and it's something that we would anticipate our stakeholders would have some concern about. So that's why I brought it up. Yeah, my only comment is I, I watch a lot of the boards and, and uh, you know, I've, I've yet to see any marketing towards that effect. So, thank you. Thanks, Peter. If there's no other comments, questions, uh, back to you, Ben. Thank you, Jack. Uh, moving forward, we have one more uh, contracting party proposal, B3. This is related to Section 29 on recreational fishing at the IPC regulatory areas in Alaska, and specifically on local consumption. And we have Kirk Iverson here who is uh, who just part of this proposal. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Kirk. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Wait through the microphone to people who are listening in too. Um, this is a relatively simple proposal that would add flexibility to what anglers, both charter anglers and uh, private anglers, could do with their catch of halibut on board their vessels. Um, currently, throughout all of their IPAC regulations for Area 2, a to B and all the areas in Alaska, we have regulations that restrict what a person may do with their halibut after they sport catch them on, on their vessels. And the regulations are pretty consistent all the way through, and they address the extent to which sport caught halibut may be delayed, mutilated, or otherwise disfigured in a manner that prevents it determination of minimum size or bag of possession weights. And, and that raises the question, well, you know, what does that really mean, the manner to which a fish could be disfigured but still allow an enforcement officer to enforce these regulations for bag of possession and size limits? Well, in, in Canada, I would note that uh, those, that specificity is part of the domestic regulations. And, and they're quite, quite prescribed and, and easy to find. The compliance is there. And, and for greater detail, uh, Ms. Mason could talk to us. Um, in Alaska, that those particular specifics are here in the IPHC regulations. And they were developed in 2008 with their uh, request of stakeholders and the enforcement officers to, again, add some specificity and clarity to what, what this really means. And so in Alaska, we see regulations that call for uh, fish could be filleted on board a vessel, but they must be taken down to no more than four fillets per fish. Two fillets from the ventral side, two fillets from the dorsal side, a small Patch of skin has to be left on each fillet so that an enforcement officer can tell if it's the dark side or the light side of the halibut. And then you're also allowed to keep the cheek pieces as well. And, and that has worked. It works very well for our enforcement officers. And it does allow flexibility for people on vessels to keep their halibut whole or break them down into pieces, especially if they're on a multi day trip and, and they're keeping uh, a greater number or have a lot of people on board. Um, I would note that there's no regulation that prevents the freezing of those fletches that are taken off the halibut. And a lot of people will do that. They'll take those fletches off, they'll leave the small patch of skin on there, they freeze them, or even vacuum seal and freeze them. Again, an officer can go on board and, and count the fletches and determine how many fish have been caught. Um, although, through the years, we have periodically heard from both charter fishermen and private anglers their desire to consume some of those, mm -hmm. some of that halibut. And so we started thinking about ways that we could add that flexibility, still enforce the regulations, 
but allow a limited amount of consumption of those, those fillets on board. And so we got together with our enforcement officers and our enforcement attorneys and developed a, a simple, our goal was to come up with something very simple, very easy to understand. And we're proposing here that one fillet, one fish that's held on board a vessel may be consumed. And all other fillets or any other whole fish are on board. That's what the officer would be using to determine the number inside the fish on board. Um, so I'll just, I think I'll just leave it at that. If, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. But the, the idea here is something very simple uh, where compliance would be expected to be very, very hot. And this would be added to the IPAC regulations, not domestic regulations. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Any questions? Moving forward, we have uh, two stakeholders' proposals, uh, and uh, the first one is related to, to the same uh, section of the regulations that I was just described by uh, Kurt Iverson, and this is the revised version that was uh, submitted the 6th of October 2022. So it includes uh, three different uh, versions of the proposal. And uh, I believe we have online Mr. Fields as well as his counsel, Brian Schroeder, who are available to speak. Uh, in more detail to this proposal, if you are. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, this is Brian Schroeder. Can you hear me? Hello? Go ahead, uh, John or Brian. Hi, this is Brian. I, I, I'm trying to, trying to get on. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Go ahead, Brian. Hi. I hope I didn't create all that feedback. Can you can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Can you hear us now? Can you hear John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is John Fields. Can you hear me? Go ahead, John. Yeah. Brian, did you want Go me? Go ahead, to John. I can. I don't know if anybody can hear me. This is Brian. I can hear you, Brian. Yes, okay, John, I don't think they, it sounds like they can't hear me. So maybe you need to go ahead. Okay. Yeah, this is John Fields. Uh, uh, can, can you, can you hear me now, please? Yes, John, please proceed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I appreciate uh, you giving me an opportunity to say a few things. I, I, I know that you uh, are behind schedule, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, uh, I think I've provided uh, uh, numerous uh, previous documents, you know, indicating um, my uh, position and involvement in fishing in Alaska. But just just briefly, I've been fishing uh, on my own personal boat in Alaska for 30 to 35 years, uh, coming up five or six times during the summer. Um, and... Uh, 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 re the recent, uh, I, I, I just have to say that most of my trips are involving my family or uh, some employees or friends. Um, 
I generally come on to Alaska five or six times during the summer uh, for trips of either five days. In some cases, uh, for example, with my daughter and her husband um, and her and my grandchildren, maybe for nine or 10 days um, during the summer. During that time, we've traditionally, you know, fished uh, and uh, really lived off the sea eating shrimp, crab and, and uh, uh, halibut and salmon. Um, I'd like to point out that we very strongly support limits and, and have been in almost total agreement with all regulations that have come out of Alaska to restrict and control uh, uh, fisheries. Um, um, in the case of my daughter, for example, she's a, a wildlife biologist that I uh, worked for University of Alaska and I think still does. And her husband actually works for NOAA uh, and, and is involved in restorations of fisheries in uh, California. Um, uh, we were in total agreement with environmental efforts and in fact, heavily involved in reef restoration throughout the world. Um, th but the, recently, the, what has happened uh, with the regulations uh, in um, Alaska uh, don't permit us to consume fish on the boat and do allow us to retain some fish frozen on a boat uh, in, in, uh, uh, in quarter sections. Um, what we're, we're simply asking is to be one, to be able to consume fish on the boat uh, and to, um, it, 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 if possible, to, to uh, store some fish for taking home. I, I, I'm a little confused as to why the, uh, recreational um, fishermen in our situation have been um, restricted. Uh, apparently, there's some kind of abuse that I'm not aware of because it certainly hasn't come in our situation. We very rarely take more than two or three fish home um, and have never, never exceeded limits. And although we've, uh, I've been received uh, um, violations on two occasions, uh, the violations have been for the condition of the fish rather than for exceeding any uh, daily uh, or annual limits. Um, but uh, we, we've made, and in our proposal, we've made some, some proposals that would allow us to um, both eat and retain some fish. I, I have to say that if I had my choice, I would simply be able to eat fish on the trip. And if we weren't allowed to take any uh, home in a frozen uh, frozen fish, uh, I could live with that. But to to uh, to allow us for to take a five day trip and and to eat one quarter section during that trip, uh, you know, uh, is really a a very little value to a fisher, fisherman like a, a me because we typically have eight people on the boat and one quarter section of a small fish uh, really can't even feed us for one meal. Um, we generally release large fish um, um, and the small fish uh, really doesn't, it doesn't give us much to eat. Um, uh, for a five or 10 day trip. Uh, so we're asking you to consider some of the proposals we've made uh, or or to consider treating uh, one of the which is to simply do have a logging um, a procedure whereby we would log daily and attract the fish daily through, through a, um, taking pictures and then identifying each piece of fish uh, that was, was retained. Um, and the other is to simply allow allow us to treat halibut uh, like salmon. Uh, salmon now is the only, really the only fish we can uh, keep and eat on a boat, uh, given that uh, the you know the rockfish uh, regulations are pretty re restrictive right now, and and of course ling cod, uh, um, it, the size limits. Uh, limit the amount of fish you could get on a daily basis or an annual basis. Um, 
so I, I think with that, I think we've made pretty clear. And, and Brian, I don't know if you're if you want to identify more specifically our proposals, uh, but um, again, I could live with a, a more reasonable consumption proposal. I don't think the the proposal for one fish um, per trip, one quarter section, really does much good for fishermen in our situation. Um, and I'm, I'm also just confused as to uh, why we have been targeted because I, I, uh, it's, uh, we really make a very small impact on the overall fishery um, situation up there. I wouldn't think there are that many recreational fishermen that, that do what we do. Um, and I don't think there's a, a fair enforcement of this because I think that the the, the uh, Alaska fishermen that, that go out maybe overnight um, are not necessarily targeted. Whereas we're out since we're out for five or six since we're out for five or six days, it, it's very easy for us to get um, uh, um, boarded boarded and checked. And uh, and again, we're we understand the importance of complying with these regulations and and have been doing that uh, as we have become aware of them um, hey John? I would, yes all rob speaking chair of the of the halibut commission um i think we've heard what your proposal is if you have anything else more to add could you wrap that up sure no i i i think we've been very clear in what the proposal is and uh and i again uh, we're just trying to uh, enjoy Alaska, and, and I want to continue to do so. Sounds good. Thanks very much, John, for explaining that to us. I'll just see if there's any questions here from commissioners. I have one, John. I'm curling. <laughs> How would this be monitored? I, I don't think we have an answer for that at this time. Okay. Is that something that's being planned? Not sure. Um, I, I'll just say we're aware of the proposal and evaluating it. Okay. Thanks, John. And um, thanks, John Field, again, for your presentation. Uh, I think we can let you go now. Hi, this is Brian Schroeder. Can the commissioners hear me? We can. I just wanted to make one point, though, that uh, uh, we have three proposals, and, and Mr. Fields mentioned two of them. One of them is a consumption proposal, so um, you know we'd ask that the the board consider that commission consider that, and we'd be happy to work with with NOAA and NIMS on uh, you know on kind of coming to some common ground. Uh, but we just think uh, consumption wise, as Mr. Fields said, that one fletch for a multi day trip you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't provide a lot of, a lot of food where if it was something like a fletch per fish, uh, on a multi-day trip that, that would make a lot, it makes bigger difference for him. Um, and I think it still allows for the enforcement folks to have no issue with counting the fish. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Yes, Peter. Yeah. I just want to clarify. So the the one fletch, <clears throat> it's per vessel. It's not per guest uh, or per licensed person on the vessel. So if he, if for instance, he said he had eight guys, and they had caught their allotment, they couldn't each take a, a portion off their fish, or or it's per vessel. Yeah. Uh Commissioner Degree, uh, through the chair. Uh, in the NIMS proposal, proposal, what is it again? B, B3, I guess. <laughs> We're suggesting one flesh from one fish on the vessel, irrespective of how many fish have been retained. All right. I don't see any more questions or comments. Thank you, Bash. Thank you, Chair. Uh, moving to proposal uh, C2, this is related to IPC fishery regulations section 5. And uh, we have uh, online Patrick Defoe, and if you agree, uh, he is willing to speak uh, in more detail to this proposal. 
Hello, this is uh, Patrick DePoe, Vice Chair at the Macaw Tribal Council. And then I would like to uh, propose a constant TCEY floor and IPH regulatory area 2A. From 2019 to 2022, regulatory area 2A has received a fixed TCEY allocation of 1.65 million pounds. This allocation put in place in accordance with the Macaw Tribe's 2019 proposal has provided consistent and biologically justified TCEY for an area which has minimal impact on the larger halibut biomass to the north. Regulatory Area 2A represents a small fraction of the Region 2A allocation and of the overall Pacific halibut stock. As such, a higher, as such, a higher IPHC Regulatory Area 2A TCEY than what may be indicated by the biological distribution of the stock estimate, which the IPHC Secretary generates, will not create a biological conservation concern. This has been demonstrated in recent years with the four-year 1.65 million pound agreement resulting in high rates, high rates of attainment in various sectors with no observed drop in survey WPUE or NPUE outside of expected variability related to the recent FISS design choices. In addition, prior to the four-year agreement in 2019, the commission has set TCEYs higher than levels suggested by the harvest decision table. Recent experience suggests that a constant TCEY floor in IPHC regulatory area 2A can be sustained by the biomass available in region 2. Historically, variable TCEY allocations and declines below a certain threshold and fishery limits from year to year created significant uncertainty and hardship for 13 halibut tribes in three coastal states, California, Oregon, and Washington, depending on the Pacific halibut fisheries in IPHC regulatory area 2A. A stable TCEY of 1.65 million pounds reduces the variability and uncertainty for all fisheries in IPHC Regulatory 2A and should be used as a floor level to the annual TCEY decisions. Uh, I appreciate the time, Commissioners, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Patrick. I'd love to see if there's any questions. I'm going to Hello, Patrick. Thank you for speaking to your proposal. Um, I had a, a couple questions for you, um, I, just to clarify. So, is this proposal forever? Um, I didn't see a time frame defined in it, so I was curious about uh, your views on that. And then I, I also wanted to invite your thoughts about the perspectives of the Macaw tribe around sharing the conservation burden associated with changes in the abundance of the resource and how you sort of see this proposal aligning with sharing the conservation burden. So we, um, we're looking at extending our previous four year agreement to another four years. We believe that the, we have concerns with, um, uh, reliability of the set line survey in regards to our marine environment here in 2A. And so we believe that this provides a, a different data set to reflect on that be more accurate of the resource that's available in 2A. As for um, sharing the burden, we are proposing this, um, this four-year agreement, taking into account that set line surveys data is up. Um, we're also encouraged to see that bycatch to the north of us is down. And we're also uh, keeping a close eye on, you know, what other relative impacts that we may have on those other areas to the north of us. And so discussion with our uh, other tribal partners and with our staff here, sharing the biological concern is we, we always wanna make sure we're doing things in a responsible manner. And that, you know, this is supposed to be a, a resource that we have envision out in perpetuity, not just for our um, folks that are fishing now, but for our future generations. And so if there's a, becomes a time where it's, it needs to be restrained, it, it comes a time where we're seeing um, reduction in our area, then we will make those changes accordingly. Um, but also understanding that 2A has a minimal to any impact to the areas the far north of us, especially the biomass. And so I, I guess um, a question for you maybe is, 
what kind of concerns to the resource in sharing those concerns are, are you are you uh, uh, discussing to? I think just my general observation is is that um, the stock's abundance changes year to year um, and over longer time frames. And um, you know, the ability to adjust how we manage in response to those changes is, is fundamental to our success in sustainable management. Um, I guess my other question was about uh, what I read as sort of part of the justification for this being about um, uncertainty and, and hardship. And I suspect this is a challenge across fishery sectors in, um, in every area. I wondered if you um, saw elements here that you think it's important for the commission to understand that might be unique to your situation in that respect. We have a different, um, an interest in a, an, an interest in, um, uh, I guess you would say, a agreement down here with regards to the tribes and as well as the areas of uh, Oregon, California, and the non-tribal in Washington. And we we do um, have a catch sharing agreement that we work with each other that does provide a little bit more difficulty on making sure that you know areas are basically. Uh, seeing what they're able to see with regards to the resource that's available. And so this can provide some uncertainty when a resource comes in at a level that's not reflective of what's actually there. And so in the past, we've had proposals of very low numbers, but can actually show histories of weight per unit effort at high numbers. And then we've also seen a reduction in bycatch in our area that suggests that there is also savings in two-way that we've been, uh, I guess, accumulating over the last so many years. And so when we end up in a position that's not reflective of what's in our area, then the strain becomes on how do we manage this, especially managing this with our uh, co-managers here in Washington. And it, it can get to a point where it starts really impact in those, not just those tribal nations, but also those small communities that depend on this resource. And so we're not, we're not trying to um, propose anything that's going to harm the resource. We want to make sure we're doing this in a, in a responsible manner. And we're also only proposing this is because we see the resource that's available. And so if the resource was not available, this proposal would not be on the floor at this time. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? I'm not seeing any, uh, Patrick. Thank you for your explanation of the uh, regulatory proposal and answering Neil's questions. If you didn't have anything further, I'd let you go. It looked like they disconnected the mic and then connected me back on, but there's no further questions from us and we appreciate the time, commissioners. All right, thanks, Patrick. Um, I think that's the last regulatory proposal. Is there anything else, Patrick? Thank you, Chair. Uh, sure. I would just mention that we have not received today any stakeholders' comments, so there will be no additional point on that. But I would just remind everybody that the uh, comments are accepted by, by, the, uh, by the Secretary up until the day before the annual meeting. So I encourage any stakeholders uh, who are interested in their point of view to be presented. Uh, we'll collate all those comments and present this discussion. All proposals that were presented today, they will be brought back again to the Commission at the annual meeting. So we'll just have a chance to, to deliberate on them again. And, uh, and that there will be an expedition to, to take a decision regarding the proposals that the Commission is interested to adopt at the end. So there's no additional actions requested today. So all the proposals will be for adoption of the federal 
And I'm also happy to answer any additional questions or if there are any questions, particularly related to the civil affairs. I don't think we took any questions at that time, but we've got any other questions. Thanks, Basha. Are there any questions or comments for Basha? No. Okay. Yeah. Don't see any. Thanks again. Are there comments on that? Uh, yes, Chair, we have two if you'd like to see those. Yeah. Could you bring those up on screen, please? <coughs> Thank you, Chair. So, so while they're being brought, brought up, the first one is, is two slides long, so I'm just going to commence it and then you can read along uh, once it comes up on screen. So the first public comment is from uh, Chuck Ashcroft and it relates to the uh, Sport Fishery, well, he's from the Sport Fishery Advisory Board rather, and again, it relates to agenda item eight. Uh, proposals for fishery regulations. Now, as I said, this is quite a, a lengthy comment, um, so please read along, um, and I will read it uh, aloud as well in case there, anyone's having connection, visual connection issues. So the topic is, in support of the regulatory change proposal, uh, proposal B2, the Sport Fishing Advisory Board, along with the Department of Fisheries Management and the province of BC, met after the results of the annual meeting are released in order to design a conservative approach to manage our TAC. It is imperative to start the season conservatively to best allow us to get through to the end of summer with enough TAC left to allow opportunity for a success, successful fall fishery and leave fish in the water while optimizing catch. We also understand that if we go over our TAC, then that overage is then deducted from our fishery for the next year, which has to be avoided. I note that in the last 10 years, our decisions have resulted in our, scroll to the next slide, uh, staying under our TAC in eight of, of the 10 years, as well as leaving uh, a little over a thousand net pounds of fish in the water. And this figure includes two years when we went over TAC. In season, the SFAB department and, and province met monthly and discussed the catch estimates received from the department in our creel and IREC for potential management opportunities up or down. The IPAC regulatory change request to match the Canadian regulation for Pacific Halibut is very important, as does give us an added opportunity in the latter portion of our fishery if we find ourselves with a high probability of not reaching our TAC. If we decide in favour of moving to three per day, this requires that Department, province, and SFAB need to be in agreement. As such, SFAB would appreciate the commission support approval of this regulation change. Thanks, Chuck Ashcroft. And so I'll pause to see if there's any comment. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Dave. I think that period after the nine is actually a comma, or should be actually. Quinn can confirm, but I think it's a million. Yeah, yeah. Uh, doesn't seem like men are we good? <laughs> <laughs> or they're good, actually, I should say. Um, are there any questions or comments on Chuck's? No, I don't see any. Thanks, Chair. The second uh, written comment is from Forrest Braden, the Southeast Alaskan Alaska Guides Organization, again on the fishery regulation proposals. Uh, and I'll read his comment. There's no doubt that chartering with anglers compare regulations between their options. It's basic to their shopping. Also, although this set of Canadian commissioners are comfortable stating that a three fish recreational bag limit is only to help target TAC with no sideboards, there is nothing statutory prohibiting a change in paradigm that allows applying a three fish limit season long. Thank you, Chair. All right, unless there's any questions or comments, I think we've concluded agenda item eight. Um, Dave, remaining on the agenda is finance and administration. Do people want a 10 minute break? Can people already carry on or just carry on? Right? Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, thanks to everyone for getting back so quickly. Um, we have two items for actually remaining. I forgot about the survey. <laughs> How could that happen? Um, so, Dave, you're going to provide us a, an overview of, of the options that you and your staff have worked on. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, and so, Dr. Stewart's going to assist me walking through the, the design components, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, um, the revenue and the cost of this side of things. And so I'll pass to Dr. Stewart. Thanks and good morning. So we we put together four sub we put together four sub options for uh, option seven, the revenue neutral design. Each of these intended to target approximately two hundred thousand dollar revenue loss. And so we'll just very briefly go through and provide you with a map and a quick synopsis of each option. So this first option we're calling 7C1 is uh, like the revenue neutral design. It uses eight skates in a few uh, charter regions where that makes a positive revenue, um, has a positive revenue effect. It's got no direct fist sampling in area 4 CD and E, noting that the trawl survey data was still used. So we still get some information from there. Um, this particular version has no sampling in 2A and 24 stations in both of 4A and 4B. The synopsis of this one is that this will provide reliable coastwide estimates of trend and biology. It's probably got a relatively low risk of overall bias in terms of our coastwide trend. It's going to have some imprecision and potential for bias at the end of the stock, particularly in those areas with sparse or no sampling at all. Does meet the uh, revenue deficit target here of approximately $200,000. I'll go even more quickly through the next couple. Uh, this is the same option, but instead of having no sampling in 2A, it has 24 stations in 2A and no sampling in 4A, and that is roughly the same uh, revenue deficit and the same consideration. The third, 7C3 is again similar to the first two now having no sampling in 4b and 24 stations each in 2a and 4a targeted 24 to try and provide for uh, a decent charter opportunity it becomes pretty sparse at less than 24 stations the final option here 7d is a compromise to try and retain a little bit of sampling in all of these areas. So we're now down to just 16 stations in 2A, 4A, and 4B, noting that that's a very sparse bid opportunity. However, 4A and 4B could potentially be combined into one charter region. So that's, again, perhaps a viable option. And in 2A, uh, there may be some additional stations associated with sampling for the state of Washington that, that might make this a, a legitimate bid, although it could still be challenging to attract a vessel for that, uh, for that work. So again, 16 stations in each and of those. The, the key difference here is in order to retain that sampling in each of the 2A, 4A, and 4B, we've also now had to drop uh, an additional charter region in 3A, the Fort Hawk region, and so that does increase the chance of some bias in the core of the stock and, of course, reduces our sampling there. However, we still have uh, several charter regions left in that IPHC regulatory area. And again, similar revenue deficit. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Chair. If I could just add as well, we do have Dr. Webster online. My apologies. He's, he's, uh, he's back at home, but he is available for additional comments. Uh, and so this additional option 7D <coughs> is simply to fill that request from the Commission uh, of yesterday to provide some stations in each of those areas. Uh, the
so we started with those uh, charter regions that had the worst performance last year as the places that need to make cuts this year. But of course, there's no guarantee that there may not be additional redistribution of fish between this year and next year. John? Uh, thanks for the additional work on this and looking at more presentations. Um, I want to see like me a little bit about the number of stations and how influential that is, how, how important that is. Uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, so in this one, 16 each in QA, and B, but K and B could be combined. Uh, if if uh, a lower number of stations is really important to potentially not being able to get bidders, uh, are, are there perhaps additional refinements here to combine 4A and B and have something less than? 32 combined stations there and add a few more stations in 2A, for example. Yes, uh, thank you. Through the chair, I'm actually going to pull in Dr. Webster, who's online, who uh, could potentially provide some additional commentary as well. Over to you, Red. Okay, I'm sorry, just connected to the microphone. I assume you can hear me. Um, sorry, I had to put it with the audio. There was multiple sounds coming into the audio, so I couldn't. Um, you can clarify what I'm responding to. <laughs> Sorry, Ray, it doesn't look like your microphone's working correctly. Just try one more time. If not, I'll pass to Dr. Stewart. Okay, we'll, we'll move on and then I'll pass to Dr. Stewart. Okay, so this 16 isn't the magic number. Uh, we, we recognize that uh, most vessels are trying to fish three to four stations per day. And so we're trying to have enough stations that there's at least a, a legitimate trip to be made. Uh, because the areas that we most would like to target in 4A and 4B are essentially adjacent to each other across that line, that, that poses much less of a problem in terms of generating you know, one area that can be sampled by a vessel without a long run between um, those two, you know, two divergent zones. So really, I think the question then is, um, would 16 be enough for 2A and or could we add more? Uh, given the current revenue forecast, in order to add more stations in 2A, we would either have to remove an additional charter region somewhere else in the stock, likely Yakutat, or um, provide some additional funding or run a larger revenue deficit. Okay. Um, Thank you for that. A, a bigger picture question, um, we've pushed you pretty hard to look at different ways of tightening things up and, and different different ways of slicing and dicing this. And uh, I guess I'm looking for a little bit of a reality check. You know, sometimes too many compromises made incrementally, the, the net picture doesn't become clear. So um, if we were to go with something like this, it, it have a reasonably good feeling about it. Thanks for the question. I appreciate the chance to speak to that. If you'll recall that in 2020, we were forced to do a pretty limited design due to COVID. Um, and although it did compromise our understanding of the specific trends, and especially at the tails of the stock, we did achieve a very reliable index, still with a reasonable CV and good uh, representative biological information. So I, because we have such strong coverage of the core of the stock, um, this, you know, essentially northern Washington all the way through to the west side of 3B. I don't have any concerns that this design is going to um, cause any compromise within the stock assessment model at that level. It will, however, reduce our ability to understand uh, potential changes in stock distribution, particularly for 4A, 4B, 2A. So to that regard, I think we should be prepared for greater uncertainty <coughs> in the specific trends in those areas next year. and to the degree that that information is relevant to management decisions, we may have greater uncertainty on the table at that time. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I'm, um, I'm more comfortable with this than other options that we talked about before. Um, I uh, raised uh, yesterday the hypothetical of uh, what if we were to scrape up something like $114,000 uh, to uh, help offset the impacts on the reserve. Um, and um, I'm told that the Department of State can do that. Um, so um, you know, that would 
take some of the pressure off. I recognize that for contingency reasons, you, you were uncomfortable about totally depleting the risk reserve. Here. Yeah, just on this, um, Dr. Stewart. Um, so we're, I guess the areas in 3A, the core of the stock that we're dropping, uh, they were profitable up until last year. I was just curious, like, did they just lose a little bit of money last year? And in prior years, they um, made it. I'm, I'm trying to figure out the risk and the reward here. Like, were they very profitable? as little as two years ago and now last year they lost a small amount you know to me it, the risk and the reward uh, might sway whether to uh, sample those areas even though you're trying to do the best you can but they're you know thanks yeah, thanks commissioner I agree. Uh, these these are all areas that ran a substantial deficit last year. We didn't achieve the full sampling that we had planned for 2022 in at least two of these areas. So we, we only sampled some of the stations in the area. I think that this really this question gets to our ability to predict how these fish may redistribute on a year to year basis and we don't have that and I think we we could we could use a planning approach that used a, an average um, across charter regions. We we are currently doing our planning on a charter region by charter region basis, and generally, the previous year has been a pretty good indicator of what we're going to see in the upcoming year. But as we all saw in the results, there were some big changes in three A this year, and um, so I, I think at this point. This is probably the safest approach is to not put too much effort in places where we would expect if at all, if nothing changes again, um, we would expect to lose money again in those areas. It's not, probably not a good choice, uh, but we certainly recognize that the revenue positive or negative um, aspects of a charter region can, can certainly change year to year. Okay, I think that, that gets to what I was thinking. Thank you. Um, I guess I, <clears throat> along the lines of what Peter was asking, I don't understand why we would trade off a core area, even though what you just said, Ian, about last year, um, things change from year to year. And given that it's a core year, I think that would be fundamental to make sure that we were able to gather that information to see if it had, did change. Um, so I'm I guess I'm not seeing the benefit of dropping that and providing the stations that are quite limited um, on the peripheral. Thanks, Commissioner Brown. I, I can I can speak to that for sure. Um, our target across the core, if if revenue weren't a weren't an, weren't an issue, would be approximately 50% sampling across the core. And that would that would achieve all of our um, CV goals, and we would have a very precise survey across the whole core. And in fact, if you recall from several years ago, one of the initial designs for sampling to make this as efficient as possible that Dr. Webster presented was, in fact, um, alternating charter regions on a year-to-year -year basis. So rather than having a randomized station selection, we would actually effectively random randomly select charter regions whole block to make it much easier for the vessels to operate. But at that level, we would still only be targeting something around 50% of the station sample. So in a general sense, you know, looking at 3A, this this proposal will still achieve roughly, if not more than half of the stations in 3A. So this isn't a, a design that we would want to repeat in, in exactly this format year after year, because that would definitely have the potential for bias. But for one year, we will have enough density through the core to provide a good, precise estimate of the stock. Uh, the key would be if we were to go with something like this again next year with, say, three charter regions missing from 3A, we'd want to make sure they were different charter regions. And that's how we've approached this um, by selecting regions that we did at least have some sampling in last year. So that answers half the question, I think. The other half is what are we getting? I added 16 stations in three areas, in each of the three areas. 
I'm sorry, I think I didn't follow your question. Well, I'm asking what do we gain by having 16 stations in each of QA, 4A, and 4B? So we're making a trade out there. So what do we gain by having those 16 stations, which are relatively small in number? So what's the benefit? Yes, thank you. Um, these 16 stations are targeted at the area that's likely to give us sampling of the most, bi most of, of the biomass <coughs> that's going to occur in that area. So it's a pretty small number, and I don't have the fraction off the top of my head, um, but these, these would be the 16 stations likely to tell us most about the trend compared to the previous year. That said, it is a small number of stations. We are making a, a it, it's getting thin at that level. And so um, I think what the question will be whether it's worth having some information to provide us at least an indication of the relative trend in those areas versus having no information and just relying on the, the space-time model to make a projection in the absence of any data whatsoever. So I, I, I in, in short answer is it's not conclusive. We are making a trade out here. I, I heard somewhere over the last couple of days that we wouldn't really make a change in CV so by not having that information in each of those three areas. Yeah, so that, that's a reference to the coastwide trend and the coastwide uh, biological information. We would definitely be foregoing information about the specific trends in the IPHC regulatory areas and, and the stock distribution associated. So we, we have our, our targets are at the regulatory area level, but anywhere near those targets will always meet the coastwise. <coughs> so from a stock assessment perspective, we, we will achieve our, our need for a reliable index and reliable biology with, with this design, with or without those 16 stations at the tails of the stock. Uh, but in terms of specific information about the trend in those areas and the stock distribution, we, we, will, we won't have that without at least some sample. Thanks, Ian. Uh, could we go back and look at slides two and three? Look at slide two. And so is, is two in, 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 in two A, is this the same as slide four? Thank you. It's not. This in this slide we actually have 24 stations in 2A and 4A. So in this particular alternative, um, we've dropped one entire regulatory area, in this case 4B, and instead of 16 stations, we have 24 in each of the remaining two. So we're trying to we're trying to provide you with an, an option here where if you could eliminate one IPHC regulatory area, you'd then get a benefit of an additional. Um, eight stations in each of the remaining two at the tails of the stock. Plus, plus we're looking at Fort Rock in this one. And we, we don't have to drop an uh, additional um, charter region in the core under this. And this, I think this really shows you how expensive it is to sample at the tails of the stock. Because just dropping that one charter region allows us to cover the other two slightly more heavily and forego having to drop another charter region. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, could you describe uh, 4B a little bit more? I mean, I've heard stuff like it's not really, it's a little different out there. Uh, so how important is it to sample there or losing that data? Yes, so 4B is the area where historically there is some evidence through the genetics that there may be some differentiation of 4B in the rest of the stock. Uh, we have an ongoing research avenue investigating that further with, with new techniques. Uh, we definitely see some different demographic trends in 4B. And I, I would have to say right now, we're not sure just how, how and whether 4B is connected to the stock in the same way that other areas are. 
And to that end, if we had to prioritize among seven C one, two, and three, essentially dropping one one of two A, four A, or four B, we would recommend keeping four B um, and either dropping two A or four A, just just because of that reason. Yes, Peter. Yeah, just in, in in trying to envision this, how that's a quite a ways out there. <laughs> and uh, do you get bids from boats or, around there, or is is could there be an expectation to actually make a reasonable bid to go all the way out there, do a few stations, and come all the way back? You can still um, get your bid in. <laughs> oh no! <I'm, laughs> I got black caught too. <laughs> Sablefish, but um, yeah, I'm just curious as to uh, you know, like is that is that even reason like to go out all that distance to to do? Uh... Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I logistically, yes, uh, that area is usually a challenge. We do uh, tend to have one or two bids and to, to go out there. Um, usually one reliable vessel that knows the area and can be out there. Um, but yes, to say that it's logistically challenging, um, yeah, is a bit of, honestly a little bit of an understatement. <laughs> yeah, and, and to reduce it just down to a small sample to me just I, I just I'm having a hard time being a vessel that would bid on that and how do you make that a feasible operation you know considering you're likely to travel quite a distance and, and uh, yeah thank you uh, thank, thank you I just wanted to note that with the, the stations that are selected um, the travel if we were to lump 4A and 4B together, uh, traveling, with, they would likely uh, be bringing their catch into Accutane or Dutch Harbor. And I would say from a logistical standpoint, these stations are a bit better than, um, like, for example, of the vessel that completed work in 4B this past year. Their travel times were like three days out to their stations on 4B, um, given that ADAC currently doesn't have a processing facility. If we were to get a processing facility in ADAC, things would really change and logistics would get a lot better. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, I guess one question I have for you, Dave. Um, John indicated that. Uh, there was uh, potential for additional, what did you say, John, $114,000? Does that change your math at all as far as the, the risk? Or... <coughs> uh, thank you, Chair, for the question. Um, from a, a fiscal management point of view, uh, I'd obviously like to target revenue neutrality rather than even going for $200,000 uh, <coughs> as a deficit. The caveat to that, of course, is that we are, depending on the design, looking at plus or minus half a million dollars. We're not sure that we'll be able to get bids out in 4B. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in, in, in the process that we're, we're, we embark upon in December, January to, to contract vessels. Um, and so any additional funds that are provided um, are obviously greatly appreciated and, and, and would certainly offset some of that, that risk. Um, how we would use that money, whether it would just go into reserve in case there's uh, overages or whether it's actually going in to fund a particular area, uh, that's something we can certainly discuss with the US to see if there was a, a preference uh, for how those funds would be used. Next year. Yeah, go on. So, uh, David, the, uh, can we could we give you um, approval of basically like the core areas in slide two <coughs> and three, and then have you monitor the market from March to uh, May? You know, you're going to get an idea of what the prices uh, of halibut is going to be if it's significantly below or trending up or the same as last year. 
and um, give you the opportunity to uh, to design during that late spring something in 2A or, or 4, 4, 4A, 4B? Thank you for the question through the chair. Um, the short answer is yes. It, it just requires us to be a little bit more dynamic in how we manage the vessel contracts and, and make it clear that there may be these opportunities that would arise in season. Um, that's something we had to try and do this year as well when we had uh, one vessel uh, drop out uh, for various issues and then trying to find replacements. Um, if we were, for example, going to try and do some stations in 2A, we could certainly make that part of the bidding process and the contracting process that there would be an opportunity for additional stations. Uh, and then we could make that decision in season uh, and, and obviously working very closely with the vessel captain, the vessel owner to see if that, that was an option for them. Um, and so it, it would certainly be appreciated if, if we were able to agree on that core design. And if you weren't ready to, to agree to um, the extra stations in 2A, 4A, or 4B, um, that that's something we monitor in season uh, and, and do our best as, 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 as it unfolds. Uh, we can update the modeling to see where we, where we think we're going to be in terms of overall revenue uh, versus expenses. We would know pretty early on what the, what the fish price is going to be. Uh, as I said, we've already bought, I think, about 80% of our bait needs um, just for this situation so that we can change it by in season to meet any of these other changes. Um, so that's our fixed price. We know what our staffing costs will be at headquarters, uh, and then it would, for our field staffing costs, again, it would be dependent upon the number of vessels. And so it's something that we can, we can model as part of the uh, projection tool and then make those in-season changes. And as I said, it's plus or minus half a million dollars depending on the design, and it could well be revenue positive if, if catch rates are higher than we're predicting and then fish price uh, remains strong. Um, thanks, Bob, for the, for the suggestion. I wonder, John, is that kind of neat what your needs are, because what I'm hearing, I think, is that you're looking to find some ways of <coughs> surveying on the peripheral areas, 2A, 4A, 4B. And um, with that, what Bob's proposed work for you at this stage? Um, I guess I'm not sure I'm absorbing the implications of it. Uh, you know, it, it, the um, part of the driver here in seeing if we could scrape up some additional funds was to know what we'd be accomplishing with those funds. Sure. And so if we're taking away that certainty, then that we're not sure where that begins. <clears throat> kind of want to know what we're buying. <laughs> and when. <laughs> um, are you saying you need to know today? Is that what you're saying? Before we commit the funds. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I understand. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're not going to commit funds and then yeah. kind of three months from now that uh, we're not doing that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, so um, yeah, I, I guess it depends on what flexibility the secretariat has on this. They have enough to move forward with contingency plans, leaving things open, not knowing if they'll get money from us. <laughs> we can live with that. Uh, I, my impression was uh, they was looking for a decision today so that they can Starting yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I'm I'm not totally clear on what might be holding us up from landing. Um, what I'm hearing, definitely correct me if I'm off base here, is from the U.S. perspective, there's an interest in touching each of the peripheral areas, right? And and that probably reflects interest on the part of your users in having surveys in the areas most they want. So that's going to be common across all areas. I think in addition to that, we heard from Dr. Stewart that there might be um, another, there might be a priority for 4B in that it's potentially sort of a bit different um, that may, you know, that may inform, that perhaps should inform our decision about um, landing on a, on a design that, uh, should include 4B. Um, I think to Peter's point, the thing that stands out to me is 
you know, we may or may not get bids in in that area, right? And so then it's like, what's the fallback plan? Um, and so maybe that's the part that's unclear for us. Um, in other words, we know perhaps we can identify what our first choice would be. Um, but but if we don't get the bids to support that first choice, uh, to your point, John, what would you be buying in terms of the alternate design, and, and are you comfortable with that? Um, that's that's sort of what I'm taking away. And so, you know, if it is a matter of touching each area, perhaps that is the kind of option A that is the place to begin. But the part we're not clear about is if we don't get what we're seeking. Um, what is the fallback option? I, I guess I see that as always being a factor. You know, there, there can be, you know, we get the bids, the, the bidder has a mechanical problem, you know, there, there are always uh, unforeseen things that could lead to outcomes that aren't what we want. So I guess we have a little risk tolerance, I suppose, recognizing that there there's some challenges here, and potentially there would be bids. If that's the case, then uh, there'd have to be some some willingness to adapt, and presumably the secretary would confer with us and get some input. Yeah, some clarification. So, and this option here isn't uh, this where um, 4 a and 3 b are, you know, they're fishing at the border, so. The potential of getting a bidder is better than the other options that included for um, for B. So it's the four B and four A. That section right there, it's kind of you know um, where one vessel would cover two regions. So it, this is a, not going to be the same scenario in the other proposals where somebody has to go and fish for B separately. So this one is kind of a hybrid, but probably get a bidder to do that borderline. That's 32 stations in proximity, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so Ian's just been running some numbers on the actual our estimate of cost per station in 4B, 4A, and Fort Lock, and 2A, and, and might just pass to Ian to quickly give an indication of what that 114 may buy. Thanks. So starting with this design here, if we put Port Lock back and put 2A, 4A, and 4B back to uh, 24 stations instead of 16, equivalent to the earlier option we showed you. That's then a net revenue uh, loss of 310,000. So essentially that 115 would cover supplementing back to 24 stations in 2A, 4A, 4B, and Fort Lock. But it also erases the FIS reserve, right? I, I thought that's what we were trying to avoid. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> what we are trying to avoid. <laughs> So there, we have on the ground. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I understand your need as well uh, with the peripheral areas. So it's not that discounted. My concern is, is the, the lack of stations or the reduction of stations, I should say, and that are in 3A. That's what's driving my question, basically, John. Um, but you know. <clears throat> To, to move ahead, um, we could go with um, this proposal for now. We'll see how the bids turn out, and that could change the uh, calculation quite immensely. Is that satisfactory? Yeah. I guess so. 
I mean, we're looking at thing. Um, there's an option that cuts out Fort Lock in 3A, and there's an option that does not. Um, both of the op, oh, maybe I was incorrect. I'm looking at the paper here that you shared last week. <coughs> And I thought there was a version of 7C that included station, thank you, the stations in both 4B and 4A. Uh, maybe that's what I was missing. There's none in 2A. So there is not an option that has some stations in 4A, 4B, 2A without cutting out. Okay. Scratch that. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just, just listening to the various comments around the room, it, it seems like you're coalescing around 7D. There is a, still a desire to not reduce sampling in Fort Lock. So maybe as a way forward, um, we were to move forward with 7D, but keep the contingency for Fort Lock to be that potential in season change. Should um, there be higher or higher bid sales, less cost for us? that um, we're, we, we do our best to try and find a vessel to sample that in that positive revenue scenario. Uh, and that's also better for us because we're only leaving one potential contract um, up in the air. We, we would get sort of contingency bids on that area. Uh, again, it doesn't mean it will be sampled. Vessels may decide that no, you know, they can't operate at that last, uh, at that late notice, but it would give us an option to, should things change on the water financially for us that we can to Fort Lock. Yeah, I think, I mean, given the uncertainty we're facing in a number of fronts, whether we get bids or not, the price, the stock, all three of those things are going to play off on what's going to uh, unfold. And so I think this option 7D is enough to go forward for now for you to do planning. As time goes on, um, we'll have more certainty about some of the other three items that are going to change the uh, revenue, if you will, for the or for the survey. So, yeah. Well, will we have a bid information by the annual meeting? Yeah, thank you. Through the chair. The current uh, tender bid specification deadline on Luca Taylor is 31 January. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, thank you. So, ge so generally, I have a, a this uh, information session on the Thursday evening during the annual meeting. And then we usually try to give at least a, a one additional week once the annual meeting has ended. Um, so will we have bids in by then? Yes, but we wouldn't have um, necessarily all bids in by then. All right, thanks, Tyler. So um, any uh, opposition to what I just spoke to as far as moving ahead? Does that provide you enough information to find this? Thank you. All right. Um, oh. I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, Dave was just pointing out the uh, predicament the U.S. government is in with regard to a continuing resolution. Uh, so, uh, contingent on what Congress in its infinite wisdom chooses to do with our budget. Uh, they need to read that somewhere. Yeah, what, what we're doing now, the, the way a uh, continuing resolution works, it keeps us at our steady budget. So, but assuming uh, nothing detracts from that, we expect to be able to. Do you know, John, when you would um, hear otherwise? Hard to say. Uh, the continuing resolution goes through December 16th. Oh, very close. Congress sometimes kicks the can, you know, and extends for a week, a month. You know. Okay. All right. Well, we'll have more information then. We'll get back to that. Okay. okay. All right, um, under finance and administration, David. Great, thank you, Chair. So we will move on to the uh, first agenda item. 
associated with that, which is for agenda, sorry, paper 15, uh, the rules of procedure. So we'll just have the PowerPoint for paper 15 brought up, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So this is agenda item 9.1, paper 15, the IPSC rules of procedure and proposed amendments for uh, consideration in 2023. So this paper is sort of our standard uh, amendment proposal for the rules of procedure based on various decisions of the commission and recommendations arising from the, the subsidiary bodies. The intention is to bring this paper to the Finance and Administration Committee in January and then to the annual meeting for potential uh, adoption. Uh, and so we're certainly seeking commission input on potential modifications, both at this meeting, but then also uh, in the intersessional period in the lead up to the Finance and Administration Committee meeting. So there are a couple of, of uh, components, rules that uh, we're proposing amendments to and that the commission has requested amendments to. The first is relating to Rule 6, specifically on sessions of the Commission. Uh, and at present, uh, sessions of the Commission are either defined as regular sessions or special sessions. Um, however, we don't have anything uh, available for uh, information sessions. And, and following a request from the Commission to draft up uh, some rules or associated with potential uh, information sessions, uh, that's what we're providing as part of this paper as listed in Appendix 1. At the moment, an informational session of the Commission or a subsidiary body may be useful at certain times. We do this a couple of times a year, such as the stock assessment information session that was held immediately prior to, to this meeting. Uh, and then also uh, we held an information session for the MSA, MSAB uh, earlier this year, uh, noting that the MSAB hadn't met uh, during, during COVID. Uh, as such, we're proposing uh, a number of uh, new additional paragraphs uh, to be incorporated into Rule 6, 11 bis through to 11.15 as shown on the screen and the uh, paper itself in Appendix 1. But the, the summary is uh, simply putting down some additional framework for the Secretariat to operate for in terms of the number of days prior to an information session when papers need to be provided, so 15 days. Um, for, for uh, invitation rather, 15 days, and then also for papers and presentations, so a 10 day deadline. The discussion we had at the work meeting was to ensure that there was flexibility, and so the wording, unless otherwise decided by the commission, has also been added, noting that it would be very challenging for um, Dr. Stewart to provide the stock assessment uh, information paper associated with his presentation. Uh, with those deadlines. And so there's just a, a, a need there to incorporate that level of flexibility. In terms of uh, Rule 8, order of business, uh, for the last couple of years, we've been operating in a, an informal rule of providing all presentations uh, no later than 10 days prior to each uh, session of the commission or subsidiary bodies. Uh, and so this uh, amendment is simply an attempt to formalize that deadline within the rules of procedure uh, so that there's no further ambiguity. This would involve adding a, an additional paragraph for this as shown on the screen, uh, which simply uh, articulates uh, that 10 day deadline for presentations. Again, adding the flexibility that the Commission uh, had requested at the work <coughs> meeting by adding the text unless otherwise decided by the Commission. This then flows into Rule 14 for the subsidiary bodies, uh, and, and again noting the information session that was held for the MSAB uh, earlier this year, uh, and some of the confusion uh, from the Secretariat's part about uh, when we should or shouldn't be providing uh, material for that meeting. And so as part of that, it's simply uh, articulating that the rules of procedure for information sessions of the subsidiary bodies are those uh, articulated for the special session or information sessions of the Commission. Uh, and so that would involve adding a paragraph 2 bis to Rule 14, uh, as shown on the screen, simply indicating that all information sessions for subsidiary bodies shall operate under the rules of procedure, uh, mutatis mutandis, 
of uh, the commission, a relatively straightforward addition. <coughs> Where it gets a little bit more complicated is the request to amend the terms of reference and rules of procedure uh, from a governance point of view for the management strategy advisory board. Um, the commission, if you cast your mind back to the intersessional decision on budgets, agreed that it would like at least one in-person hybrid MSAB meeting uh, in 2023. It was uh, agreed by the commission that this could occur in either mid-2023, so our May meeting, when we usually hold uh, an MSAB meeting, or in the standard October meeting time slot, as we held one uh, this year. As part of that, and noting the, the budgetary uh, discussions at the time, it was also uh, agreed by the Commission that the MSAB membership may need to be reviewed, uh, including the travel expenses and the budget for non-government members. We have taken both the uh, amendments that were originally proposed for the work meeting and taken those to the MSAB. Uh, we've incorporated the various suggestions uh, for amendments uh, into Appendix 1 of this paper. Um, one of the areas that the MSAB uh, isn't really able to comment, though, is, is the overall uh, budget or cost for an in-person MSAB meeting. At present, we currently estimate around $40,000 uh, is required for an in-person MSAB meeting. Uh, to pay for the non-government board members to attend uh, the meeting in Seattle. We have an approximate breakdown. This is what we've, we've estimated for 2023, um, just as, as, as a reference for you. Uh, as, I, as I indicated, we took this through the work meeting and then we took the MSAB 17 in October, uh, and all of the edits that uh, were suggested by the MSAB have been incorporated into uh, appendix one of this paper and in track changes. So the intention moving forward is that we're going to continue to, to engage with the commissioners uh, to get your input on how you would like us to either continue to amend or uh, the MSAB current terms of reference and rules of procedure, or whether there's a more fundamental change that you would like to make in terms of the uh, governance or mandate rather. Uh, of the MSAB moving forward. I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. Thanks, Dave. Um, questions? Fisher. Right, just some clarification. So, um, the evidently is like informal and formal information sessions. So, what's the difference? Like, like Ian's stock assessment that was done the other day. Is that an informal one where who's invited to these? Like, is it public open to all information sessions or just formal ones? Thank you, uh, through the chair. And I think that's precisely uh, where some of this confusion has, has arisen. Um, from, from our perspective, they're, they're all just information sessions. Um, as the invitations as will be articulated in the rules of procedure indicate that the chair and vice chair are able to determine the participation for any of those sessions uh, on, a, on any given basis. Uh, and so the the, um, the onus, the mandate will be driven by the chair and vice chair of the commission in terms of what those meetings are uh, and who would be invited to attend. Uh, and so by doing that, the intention is to uh, not have that confusion about what's an informal versus a formal information session. So it will be treated the same way, but there will be the potential for uh, rural exemptions as decided by the Commission on a case by case basis. Thank you. David, would it be correct to also say uh, at informal meetings there are not um, decisions going to be it's more for information? Yes, Chair, that, that, that's correct. Uh, the, the understanding of the Secretariat that, that, that these types of information sessions that we have held uh, in the past, that there wasn't any particular um, document deadline or presentation deadline and, and no report of those meetings. Um, it, was, it was purely for, for information sharing uh, and to bring various parties uh, up to a common ground of understanding on a particular issue. Thank you. Uh, Neil? Just a really minor point because I, I take take the 
Secretariat's point on slide five about um, you know, the wording regarding timelines. Uh, and if I look at slide four, it says 10 days before, unless otherwise decided by the commission. I, I, I guess I worry a bit about the decided by the commission part. Uh, it'd be hard to get decisions out of all six of us. And so I wonder if we can find some way to make the wording a little more flexible for the secretariat in that way. Um, I don't have the solution. I'm just going to be flagging a bit of an issue there. And, and maybe maybe we can find an informal way to, to get direction to the secretariat about you don't need to abide by the 10 days. But I think that seems to be a key point. And I'm thinking about the stock assessment in particular. So that we don't hang ourselves up where you're trying to get all six of us to respond and say, is it okay if we get something to you two days before or what have you? Uh, thank you. Through, through the chair, uh, one way to potentially simplify that is to replicate the text that's shown in 12 bis um, and simply li limit it to the chairperson and vice chairperson, mm -hmm. um, thereby just re reducing the number of contacts that would be required. I think that would be a sensible solution. <coughs> So I have a comment on MSAB. I don't want to interrupt this discussion on sessions, so we're done on sessions. Um, yeah, go ahead with your question. So I no notice we have a number of people that have retired. A um, number of people um, have uh, aren't, aren't participating um, for whatever reason, and. Um, I'm not objecting to to uh, making the, the MSAB more uh, cost efficient. We have uh, cost issues. I did notice that we had a um, someone submitted uh, their name for uh, participation from representing U.S. processors. Um, we haven't had a representative there. If we're going to continue with the MSAB, I, I would like to have a representation there but uh, I'm supportive of making it more streamlined and fitting with our budget did you have um, a matrix that you that the staff wanted to present or of who, who you wanted to see on 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 this so I, not who but the, the positions represented um, yeah, thank you for the question and through the through the chair uh, for the MSAB 17 meeting we did provide uh, that membership uh, list and breakdown with with a, a relatively coarse proposal to en encourage discussion uh, of simply halving the number of, of representatives for each each area uh, and so for example there were commercial fishers halving it from eight to four that, that type of thing um, that was certainly met with a resounding uh, pushback uh, at, by the MSAB itself. Uh, I think we spent about three hours uh, discussing uh, membership, membership terms and um, various needs to, to be represented. Uh, and, and I think that's why in this current version that has just simply been removed and we've left it as it is, uh, noting that I think this is, is a higher level discussion and decision that needs to be made in, in terms of budgeting, but then also representation. Um, and so uh, the secretary is certainly very hesitant, uh, given that reception, to, to propose uh, cuts in, in representation at this point. Uh, and, and more push it from uh, the point of view that uh, it costs around $40,000 to pay for the current membership. If the, if the commission would like the MSAB to meet in full next year, we'll need to incorporate that into the budget in October. So it'll be the 2024 budget. Um, or whether there are issues that the commission is identifying in terms of the functioning of the MSAB uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a general sort of comment that over the last uh, couple of years it's obviously been very challenging with, with, with COVID um, and with our most recent uh, MSAB meeting it was certainly a challenge for, for the group to come up with recommendations to the commission to, to move things forward uh, and, I, and I think at the point of adoption we had two recommendations um, being proposed from the MSAB were revolving entirely around the rules of procedure uh, and not the MSE process itself. Um, 
So, so I guess there's a internal governance or, or mandate discussion as well that could be had, whether it's here or intercessionally, about what role the Commission sees the MSAB having moving forward. Uh, whether you would like to see it functioning in the same format or, or whether you would like it to potentially uh, be redirected in terms of the types of things you would like them to review and also the type of advice you'd like to be receiving from them. Uh, over that chair. Yeah, thanks very much, Dave. Um, anything else about the MSAB? Well, I think it's a unique group, uh, group that we've had. And I think uh, the mix of the different entities and stakeholders, um, regardless of the number, can address a variety of different uh, ideas that we, we have and come up, up with, whether it's uh, side limits or something more uh, to do with the, the stock assessment. So um, I'd like, I, I, I'm a supporter of the MSAB, but I'm also uh, physically conscious of where, where we are on money, so. Um, I have a couple of observations about the MSAB. I think, um, Dave, your point about focusing the MSAB on things that they can deal with is uh, to me critical. I think that they've spent quite a bit of time on allocation issues, which are more policy driven than but they spent a lot of time on that, and I think we as commissioners should be providing direction to the MSAB of the key areas to focus on, and I would say they're more technical. And then as far as the makeup goes, any type of committee that I've seen arise over the years, regardless of whatever they're focused on, membership is always a, a big, big issue for sure. Everyone needs to, wants to see the, a role or room for them to put forward their views. Um, having said that, I, I do think there could be some room to uh, focus the membership as well, or at least have a discussion and see if that's possible. I know that one's a challenge. Well, that would be the two things it would be my observation. So I guess, I mean, just to further that, John, I wonder, uh, we should, I'd like to make some room on the agenda so that we can have a talk or a discussion about the MSAB and how to make best use of it. Um, I'm a strong proponent of the MSAB. I think we need to have that um, committee. Um, so they provide input to us, but I'd like to see if we can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of it. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I should know the answer to this, but I don't. Is there a, a uh, charter or a terms of reference or something like that? Has that been updated in recent history? Good day. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Through the chair. So we last updated the MSAB terms of reference, I'm going to say in 2020, I believe. Um, and so that's the, the, the core text that's provided as the appendix one of the paper, the, the text in black, is the existing um, terms of reference, the rules of procedure for the MSAB. Uh, and any of the, the text in track changes uh, is, is what we've sort of been working on over the last little while. Okay, so that would give us a good job. All right, um, uh, Peter. Yeah, just on the MSAB, uh, you know, I'm very supportive of, um, it's unfortunate uh, we are in these budgetary conditions, you know, due to inflation and all that kind of stuff, because I, I see real value in, uh, um, and what those people bring to the table and their experience and knowledge, um, you know, especially uh, in such a, you know, it's, it's very broad, and uh, they they're basically essentially giving their time uh, for free, which uh, is very reasonable, I think. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, I commend people that do do that. I do understand that we are under these budgetary con conditions. And uh, I agree with uh, both things that we may have to focus things and also that, uh, you know, allocation has become part of that conversation that wasn't helpful. Um, and so, yeah, if we can streamline it uh, somewhat and uh, keep it focused, I think that would be essential. But I think it's good to recognize the people put in a lot of time and uh, energy. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Any other comments on MSAD? <coughs> Back to you then, David. Great, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and so with that, we can move on to the next agenda item and the Secretary could bring up uh, paper 16, the presentation, please. And uh, Andrea is going to present that for us. So over to you, Andrea. Right. Thank you. All right, so the audit is going uh, very well right now, and I'd like to highlight the relatively new team that is helping with this. So Rebecca and Tara on our personal services team have been incredibly thoughtful and organized through this process, and I also want to thank Kayla. Um, who has been a huge part of the audit process as well because a myriad of transactions do go through with the FISC. Somerville is our outside accounting team. They have been responsive and a pleasure to work with. <clears throat> and the audit team at Moss Adams has been professional and timely. These, is, these have been very positive meetings and then we've established a great working relationship in the last 90 days. We are on schedule with a final wrap-up meeting scheduled for December 15th. The preliminary report from Moss Adams will be presented to Dr. Wilson and I on the 17th, and I'm confident that we will have the final report on the 19th as stated by the contract. Moss Adams partner Olga Darlington is scheduled to virtually present the audit during the FAC meeting at the upcoming annual meeting. As you can see on slide five, uh, Moss Adams has alerted us to a substantial increase in fees for the coming years. I look forward to facilitating a, a competitive bid process in the spring and early summer to ensure that we are fiscally, fiscally responsible with this contract moving forward. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. So um, I don't believe we're in the bidding process, but uh, if you were satisfied with Moss Adams, have you thought about going back and offering them a reduced increase? Yes, Mo Moss Adams will be uh, definitely engaged in the bidding process, and so they will, they will understand what I'm looking for. <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Thanks, Andrew. Great, thank you very much. If we could have presentation 17, for paper 17 brought up, please. Okay, so this uh, paper relates to agenda item 9.3, paper 17 <laughs> in particular. Um, and we're just going to provide you a bit of an update on where we're at for 2023. So just a reminder that the financial period starts 1 October 2023 and extends through to 30th of September. Uh, of, that should be 2022 to 2023. Again, recalling that uh, in March of this year, you adopted a budget uh, for total contributions from the contracting parties of just over $5 million uh, for use in the general fund. Uh, and a reminder that that general fund includes fund 10, 20, and 30, so research and also statistics, so our data collection programs, uh, but not the fishery independence outline survey. The contributions as shown on, on screen uh, with, with Canada, uh, approximately just a little bit over 900,000, and we have received those payments, uh, that payment on the 26th of October. Uh, and as I think was pointed out on day one, the contributions from the, from the US are, are on their way. In addition to those general contributions, there are two voluntary contributions that are, are requested each year and, and then one for the building lease and maintenance. The voluntary contributions relate to 50% of the International Fisheries Commission pension fund. And so just a reminder, this is the old fisheries uh, pension fund which closed in 20, 2001. Uh, and so it's, it's been 21 years now that that plan has been closed. And of course we have retirees uh, in operating from that plan. Uh, and we have one remaining staff member who's, who's actively uh, contributing to that plan. Uh, all others are on our standard 403B plan. 
and so this doesn't relate to them. Uh, as part of the um, agreement for the International Fisheries Commission Pension Fund, uh, both contracting parties uh, offer to pay 50% uh, of a amortised over 10 years uh, deficit payment, and that stands at just a little bit over 127,000. Uh, as I said, um, these are optional payments to, to the deficit uh, fund, or to cover the de deficit rather, uh, and, and should those payments not be made, uh, the deficit just simply grows, and, and uh, as a result, uh, when, the, when the, there's a new actuaries report done on that plan, um, th those amounts would, would increase. In addition, we have the standard contribution to the headquarters building lease and maintenance costs. Uh, this is uh, solely for the USA. Uh, again, at four hundred eighty-nine thousand uh, dollars, and again, we've invoiced for that, uh, and we'd expect the payments uh, in the mail. A reminder that for during FY 2022, um, it was the second year that we've been operating under a fund-based accounting system, uh, and in doing so, there, there's naturally uh, some bugs that we're working out through the system where we're identifying that uh, particular expenses are, are more appropriate in a particular, in another budget line or, or within a specific fund. Examples that we have uh, improved upon over the last couple of years are salaries and wages and benefits. So rather than simply allocating all of them to 10 general, which is the administrative fund for, for headquarters, uh, we now allocate that across uh, all of the funds. So the correct salaries, benefits and wages going to the research team uh, budget uh, the statistics team, uh, and then also for the Fishery Independent Satellite Survey. This has brought a, a heightened level of uh, accounting accuracy across all of our funds and our, our core programs and activities, which is uh, certainly being appreciated uh, not only, very much internally. So not only does the executive management and accounting services have access to those uh, almost real-time uh, accounting practices, but each of the, the team leads, the branch managers who have uh, financial responsibility are able to go in and scrutinize those accounts uh, on a real-time basis. Uh, so that's been a substantial improvement. So as part of our plan leading up to the FAC 19, we do expect to incorporate some of those uh, additional refinements into the various uh, funds uh, and bring that to the commission for uh, additional uh, renewal or adoption that will not result in any adjustment to the contracting party contributions for 2023, but rather simply just assist us in better reporting uh, our expenses in, in appropriate budget lines. Now, to cover off on, on uh, the need for some of those, for example, uh, in Fund 30 statistics, we uh, the Commission approved in March of last year as part of that intercessional decision a budget line of $644,000 uh, for the NOAA port sampling grant uh, from NOAA. With a, a shortfall in that grant of uh, just under $43,000, million, $43, um, where we're currently reviewing where within that budget we'll need, need to make some cuts uh, in services so that we can uh, not have a budget uh, overrun. Similarly, for the Fishery Independent Setline Survey, so this is Fund 40, noting that the Commission um, usually adopts a, a survey design for the, the, the coming year at this interim meeting, which is what you've done a short time ago, that budget needs to be, to be updated um, because the, the proposed budget or the tentative budget that we put forward to you for the Fishery Independent Setline Survey was an approximation. Um, moving forward, uh, we're going to propose that we don't offer a budget um, for, for example, for 2024 for the Fishery Independent Setline Survey at this coming FAC meeting, uh, because it really is just a placeholder budget. Uh, and the, the amounts, the, the income and expenses are entirely or largely driven by the preceding year's uh, expenses and, uh, and expected revenue. And so we'll be bringing that to you for adoption at FAC 99. So just as a, a summary, we will be bringing that FY 2023 budget back to you at FAC 99 for additional review. Uh, we do have uh, one additional grant for biological and ecosystem right research that we will incorporate into that budget. So you'll be able to see where that income is going to be allocated to and the associated uh, expenses in here. 
Uh, and so with that chair, it's simply just a matter of uh, noting the paper and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Dave, John? If you go back to slide three, please. So um, not a question per se, but um, I, I just want to make the observation that um, the agreement between the parties is for equal contributions towards the administrative expenses of the commission. And um, clearly the U.S. has been carrying a disproportionate share of the load. Um, so look forward to continued discussions with my Canadian counterparts on uh, how to bring that more into balance. Yeah, thanks, John. I guess I'd make two observations. Um, I guess first off, um, clearly the parties are sharing 50% of the resource as they've done quite a number of decades ago. It's changed substantially. And um, I think the second observation I'd make is that even today at this meeting, the U.S. is providing or offering $114,000. And so that's <coughs> coming from the U.S., but again, um, that is something that the U.S. Um, would like to do. And so that's kind of how this whole process started back in 2000, where the U.S. decided for some needs that they had to increase contributions. And so I think that is an ongoing challenge. And uh, as I've said at a number of meetings over the time, that Canada is not looking to increase its contributions. I think there's solid justification for why it's at its current contribution uh, contribution level. Um, it's currently more than what we're getting from the resource. I think right now we're at probably 23% contribution. And um, our harvest levels are lower than that. And so I recognize that uh, this may be um, not something that U.S. would like to hear, but um, that's Canada's position. I do have a question for Dave. <clears throat> um, uh, is there progress on headquarters lease or um, headquarters agreement? In terms of a formal headquarters agreement, no, uh, we do not have a formal agreement in place uh, with, with the U.S. Um, my understanding is that. Uh, there, and, and well, maybe I'll pass to the U.S. to, to see if there is an appetite for, for developing a formal headquarters agreement. I know the Sami Commission in, in Canada was it, was it a new agreement for the first time. Uh, I'm not sure, but maybe that's something that we could uh, attempt to move forward with. But at this point, no, there's, there's been no particular progress with uh, headquarters agreement. You could be wrong, Dave, but are you taking out insurance so that you don't? Um, require or um, have some liability of signing the contract. Uh, thanks, Chair, for the question. Yes, we do have director and officers uh, in insurance that covers us for, for that kind of liability. All right, thanks. Um, anything else on this budget on this item, uh, Peter? Yeah, in regards to, I think, the next slide, but. Um, uh, the pension fund. Um, you said uh, it was a, a 10 year deficit payback. I'm just curious where we're at with that. Um, it's been around since I had to sit through these, so we must be getting close. Uh, yes, I, I, I sat at a meet, meeting last week, was it uh, getting the, an, an update on, on the plan itself? Um, so this is an amortized uh, payment schedule for, for a 10-year period based on the actuary's report that was done I think, three years ago, so they're due for, for a new one. Uh, and so in the discussion of, of last week, uh, unfortunately, with the, because the funds are still invested, with the substantial downturn in, in markets, uh, I think it's down about 80, 18% overall for, for the past year. And so um, it's likely to be a, a moving target. Uh, so depending on whether the, the, the value of the, the reserves associated with the fund itself are, are going up or down, that deficit will, will increase or decrease accordingly. And so noting that it's about 18% down on, on last year, uh, effectively the deficit grows irrespective of, of, of the payments that, that are being made. And that 
I would expect. The indication was that um, the actuary's report is, is likely to indicate that those deficit payments will need to be increased for another 10 year period. But it's, it's, a, it's a wait and see as they're working through those numbers at the moment. Okay, and so whereabouts are we on the first 10 years? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, and so this is the third year of payment. And so the deficit, if you multiply these by 10, so we're 30% we're through. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other question I had is uh, you mentioned something, uh, mentioned uh, removing uh, the FIS from uh, like the budgetary for 2024. Uh, just wondering where you would account for the fixed costs that you're going to, uh, you know, encounter where, you know, so we're able to track that as well. Yes, thank you very much. And so if you look at the appendix uh, of, of the paper itself, um, it actually has the budget that was adopted at the intersessional meeting. Uh, and if you scroll down to the bottom, you will actually see that there's a, a, a line that is essentially cost recovery. Uh, and that's where we move those salaries uh, post facto uh, between between the funds. And so, if we're not specifically uh, ad adopting a 40 FIS fund budget for 2024 at this upcoming FAC meeting, it would simply uh, appear as as, as a um, expected revenue from outside outside the fund 40. So it would be accounted for uh, still within the overall 10 general budget noting that there's an expectation that those salaries are, are paid for uh, as, as part of fund 40 when the funds are received in here. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this agenda? So I think that concludes everything there. Yes, Chair, we just have uh, two slides quickly about uh, preparation for the annual meeting next year, uh, and then also just one as a reminder of the, the 100th anniversary dates. So just on, on screen, um, as I said, we just have two slides for you. The first is, is just a reminder that we are approaching the commencement of our commencement of our 100th year. The IPHC will turn 100 on the 21st of October 2024, and so that 100th year commences uh, on the 21st of October 2023. We have some details on, on obviously um, when the convention was ratified, uh, but it's it's just a, a, an open point for the commissioners if you would like to consider a discussion here or um, to further the discussion on, on additional preparations or, or activities and funding that you would like to consider uh, in support of that uh, 100th year of, of the commission. So I'll pass back to you before I go to the last slide. Yes, yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so, what have you done as far as planning for hundred years? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. So, we're operating within a, a, our current budget, uh, and so this would be the 2024 budget, and so we'll potentially bring some additional uh, budgetary ideas forward at the FAC meeting. At present, the with the 100th year starting on the 21st of October 2023, this coincides with the Pisces annual meeting, which will be held in Seattle that same week. Uh, and so we are currently planning a, a, a kickoff um, workshop associated with uh, the 100 year of research and, and science and monitoring at, at the IPHC uh, at the Pisces meeting. And that this is uh, going to continue on the efforts that Dr. Planas has been doing over the last couple of years where we've held a dedicated uh, workshop component uh, at each Pisces annual meeting. And so the fact that it's going to be in Seattle is, is obviously a, a low cost option for us, uh, but also very impactful uh, given the scientific community that's going to be present. Moving on from that, the next event would obviously be the annual meeting itself uh, at the end of January in 2024. Uh, at, at the moment, we are just simply looking at uh, various venues that we could hold, uh, whether it be larger receptions and, and looking at and sort of brainstorming on ideas about who could potentially uh, come to that meeting from the secretariat stakeholder uh, component. And we would like to uh, receive, whether it be intersessionally or between now and the annual meeting or at the annual meeting, maybe suggestions from commissioners about uh, the higher level uh, presence that you may wish to, to attend. Uh, and, and what type of function you would like to hold. Uh, subsequent to that, later in the year, again, we're very fortunate that the World Fisheries Congress is going to be held in Seattle as well. 
uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us uh, to once again uh, hold a dedicated session uh, on the Commission on the Pacific Halibut, where we'll be showcasing um, the various activities of the Commission from a scientific and research perspective over the last hundred years. So those are the three core elements that we're, we're thinking about. Um, the staff are, are obviously very excited about it and have many, many ideas for smaller ideas and smaller outreach events. Uh, and again, they're going to be uh, considered as we move forward on, on a budgetary uh, available route basis next year. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, so have you got to the place of, of, of sort of budget or still just on the idea stage? So the, the budget for the two outer elements, so the uh, Pisces meeting and the uh, World Fisheries Congress will simply fit within our travel meetings and conference uh, components. But for the annual meeting, no, we haven't uh, figured out what, what, what that might look and what it might cost and whether we're, we'd be looking at flying people in or whether it's a purely uh, voluntary attendance, requested attendance. So we, we don't have a much of that. All right, thanks, Dave. Any questions, comments? Yeah, I was just curious if you'd uh, uh, thought about or considered bringing in um, a lot of the old commissioners for uh, one of these events and uh, for the annual meeting, maybe it might, might be a nice thoughtful gesture. Uh, the short answer is, is, is yes, uh, both for the annual meeting as an option, uh, but then also potentially for dedicated events, um, for example, at the, the Wooden Boat Museum or the Nordic Museum. Uh, in Seattle, where we have uh, a lot of connections with the Jordan Chole, for example, having been uh, donated to the uh, Wooden Boat Museum um, in Seattle. It, it, there, there are various options, and, and the short answer is yes. We've been looking at how we can try and uh, engage with that history of IPHC on, on all levels. Thank you. Yeah. So, really encouraging to hear some of these ideas, I think. Be really well received. Um, I, just a couple suggestions. Um, I, I think uh, be the point at which uh, EIPs or whoever on either side might uh, choose to kind of participate in something like I'm thinking on our side, for example, for our minister, um, is probably going to be closer to the actual anniversary. Um, but it also takes a fair bit of advanced planning to, to make all that happen. And so uh, I think one suggestion would be, not, not urgent, but that maybe we start to make the connections between the right people on the party's sides to be exchanging any ideas about what sort of event that might involve uh, elected officials could look like or how much appetite there is for that, um, just so we've got a line of communication open. Um, Again, it doesn't need to happen next week, but uh, something for us to keep in mind. Um, I, the other thing I didn't quite catch, the World Fisheries Congress was when? Thank you, Chair. Um, through the Chair, I'm just trying to recall exactly when it is in, in 2024. Um, it, it's later in the year. I just can't recall uh, okay. exactly when it is. I, I thought it was 2023, so that's fine. So, 3rd to 9th of March 2024. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else, Dan? So, just a, a general reminder for our uh, upcoming meetings in uh, uh, Victoria. I'm actually don't have those on the, on the screen. Uh, so with, with our, our, our meetings, the, uh, we'll commence with the Finance Administration Committee meeting. Uh, we will then hold the annual meeting itself or the um, Fairmont Empress in British Columbia, Victoria. The registration pages for those meetings are all active. We Each of those meetings has an agenda, a draft agenda and schedule already published with an associated potential list of documents. Um, for anybody wishing to attend, it would be greatly appreciated, particularly because this will be the first meeting that we'll be holding in person of this nature um, since before COVID. Uh, please do go onto the website, register for the meetings that you wish to attend. Um, if you are on the Processor Advisory Board, please uh, remember to submit the, the free accreditation 
um, noting that Secretary of State has taken on full administration of that board for the first time. Um, for the conference board, similarly, if you are going to attend and you are, did not attend last year, you need to submit your, your accreditation form as well, and the chair and vice chair will review those forms um, at the start of the meeting. Uh, and with that, I think that's all I have. Thank you, chair. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, John, anything else in here? Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? No. Well, thanks again, Dave, for a, a very productive meeting and well organized and uh, safe travels home to you. We're adjourned.